YouTube as well. Right. And just just check it if it is there. Yes, sir. I'll I'll check it, sir. Yeah. So, guys, uh, we'll go in the order which we have uh, decided. Okay. So first will be yeah. Kumar Shantanu, then Girish, Mahesh, Rahul, Parth. Abhijit is not there. Indrajit, Kamla Karrao, and then Kapil. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll give you three minutes. So I think three minutes or three, three and a half max for discussion uh, for uh, presentation. And then. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, it is streaming live on YouTube now. Okay, excellent. So I'm going yeah. to close it. I'm going to close it so you can you can just keep an eye on it. Okay. Sir, sir, can I can I reclaim the host? Sorry. So can I reclaim my host so, so that I can make other doctors as a host and uh, proceed? Yeah. So it won't affect your live uh, YouTube live streaming. Sir. Three and a half max for discussion. Okay, you can. Yeah, that's fine. You can yeah. click it and then uh, yeah. fine. Okay. Hi Pradeep sir. Hi Anjali. Hi Shamu sir. Hi, Hi hello. How are you? Good. How are you? You you seem like you've just played Holi, Anand sir. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have all the blue dots on your face. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the merging. It's the merging of the the your background on his face. Yeah. yeah. That's better. Kartik. Okay. Hi Kartik sir. Hi. Hello. Oh. oh. How are you guys? Hello, sir. Hello, Pratik, man. How you doing? Hello, All well. Namaskar. All good. I like the I like Indrajit's uh, pagdi. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I I just finished a TKR, a very bad TKR. Oh, really? It's what? It's very. You you did it very badly, or it was a very bad case? <laughs> it was a very bad knee. I did okay. <laughs> Hi, Anish. How are you? I'm good, Karthik. How you doing, bro? Yeah, I'm good, man. I'm good. I remember our days in in Breckenridge. I know. I don't know when we're gonna do that again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's good to see you all. Anyway, that's great stuff. Hi, yeah. Mahesh. How are you? Fine. Uh, Hi, Mahesh. Sir. Fine. I, I, I Hello, Indrajit. Uh, Doctor Sony, I, I've yeah. been a big admirer of yours. I've seen all the stuff that you're doing, man. You're doing some great stuff. Thanks, sir. <laughs> yeah, fantastic cases, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, you you need to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sir. Well done, well done. Thank so, you, uh, 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 Pradeep, are you um, are you uh, still still uh, stuck at home? You're not uh, operating or anything. So, as I said, um, I I do probably two or three times a week clinic in the afternoon. Very few patients. And only trauma, which cannot wait. Otherwise, I yeah, have yeah. the last what two months four cases. Right. But no, I mean, it looks it looks like Mumbai yeah. is is really hotting up with the cases, huh? Yeah. And there's some pretty awful, sad stories about you know people going from hospital to hospital, uh, not able to find a bed, and you know it's it sounds pretty grim. Yeah, because I was so what you see in the picture in the on the uh, what do you hear on the news? The situation is probably ten times worse. Gosh, man! They are influential people who are not getting beds in the hospital, COVID or non-COVID, whatever it is. They're not That's getting awful. it. Why okay. is that? Because is that the hospitals are scared that they're, they're carrying COVID or what? No, they don't have beds. But oh, they, they don't, don't have beds. Yeah. Gosh, bloody yeah. hell! So that's why. That's awful. That's awful, man. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, is is that just with? Private hospitals, or is it government hospitals too? Everything is full. Government already full a long time back. It's the private hospitals, and they have to shell out a hell load of money. Um, so the people taking money. advantage of the situation as well. Not much actually. The whole maximum cost which is coming to is the the PP kits, where in a day you are shelling out almost extra another fifteen twenty thousand just on the PP kits for a twenty four hour mm. care. Yeah. And what about you, Shantaru? Where are, what's what's it like where you are? Well, uh, Bihar was okay. I I stay in the northeastern part of Bihar. Yeah. And there were not cases almost a fortnight back, but after that there was something called migration of laborers. 
The migrant oh, yeah. laborers. Well, that's a, another you, tragedy, man. That's yeah. another horrible tragedy. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and those laborers, unfortunately, when they came, they mm. were stuck up in places like Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Delhi, and other places. But when they came back, they brought COVID along with them. That is the problem now. Crikey. But we are opening up now. And are just, you? just a oh, while ago, okay. I operated in case of badly uniting uh, Shaft femur because he just had an injury before COVID, before lockdown uh. in March. And oh. then he couldn't go to any doctor. And when, I, when he has come to me two days back, there's a big kind of overlap. And I had to free that and bring it in the level. So that was a very big bloody kind of surgery. Same, same I did yesterday, Dr. Shantanu. I did okay. one case, two months old femur. Okay. <laughs> young female, primary, primary gravida, young female. Gosh. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh I'm so glad I don't do bloody femoral fractures, man. Thank God for that. Me too, yeah. me too. <laughs> we don't have a choice. I've done, I've, I've done one hip, one bipolar, or one hemi in the last five years. Yeah, well. I haven't, I don't know I haven't seen the inside of a hip in 17 years now. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The way I want to make it run is three, three and a half minutes. I would like uh, the, the guys to present the cases. And then I want Anish and Karthik to take over. Um, I would want you to go through the cases, the panelists, and ask whatever the questions. Once we finish that, we will give the other case presenter chances. Please put your hands up and we'll, we'll see if we have time, we'll do that. And probably in the last 30 seconds or so, if we have something on the chat, we will take up those cases to get some uh, delegates involved as well. Uh, I really apologize right from the start if I do not take everybody on their questions. So really apologies. I think because we have now eight people presenting it, I want everybody to do the justice for their cases to be presented properly. And, and no, no. beyond to us, I think uh, beyond to us, people start, people start leaving the webinar. So I want their money's worth it. Though it's, there's no money, in, but at least their time is worth it. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Any, any, uh, anything, any comments or any tips, anything you want to add? Because uh, we you, could... need, you need to be a good moderator. Yeah, because we could we could take one cases and we could go for 25 minutes, yeah. but that will just knock on with the rest of the guys and it's not fair. Yeah. So shouldn't we take the case like pre-op first and then discuss what should have been done and what was done and then to be decided, not finish the case at one go. Then it breaks the charm of the case. Mm -hmm. You know, we can just um, keep pre-op there, have a discussion and then show that this is what I did. I think, yes, it would, that could have been done if you were doing like 10 to 15 minutes per case. But since we haven't done it, or been, since we do not have that kind of time, I think we'll stick to as what individually people have done it and why they have done it. And, and Karthik and Anish can uh, put their comments and, and make it interesting. Right. If you want, if you want, if the individual presenters want, they could stop it and ask for an opinion. But uh, but may, we will make sure that we finish those cases on time. Perfect. Okay. If that's what you have prepared it, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Right. Okay. It's somebody about time. To, somebody need, just a moment. Somebody needs to call up Girish because after Shantanu is Girish. Uh, Jayesh, do you have Girish's number? I'll call. I'll call. Yes, sir. I'll call after Girish. Call. Okay. Indrajit, can you call? I'll call, sir. Okay. I think we are, we have one minute still left. So we are okay with that, I think. And at the outset, I would like to thank Anish, Kadakya and Karthik uh, for taking this time out for really, really, I know Anish, you have been up since what? 6, 6.30? Yeah, make, make sure, sure that... I didn't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So really, really appreciate that. And I know it's a weekend, Saturday morning, and I know how dearly you like to get your sleep. And I hope you have that masala tea in your hand made by whoever it is. My father-in-law. I job. know that. I know that. I know. Okay. And Good Karthik, evening, sirs. I, I'm just, uh, yeah, my, my thing was uh, muted till now. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening. 
and kartik thank you again for joining in um really really appreciate i know you are going through some rough time um, right. i don't want to go into the details i hope everything's fine with that right. and hope at least these two hours takes the mind off those stuff well, and you I, can I, give your valuable input into this i look forward to these sessions man i need i need a break i know i know so dr is having some internet connectivity issues sir uh, sir will join uh, as the problem solved Like yeah, I think the I think the cyclone has hit Nagpur as well, probably. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Don't tell him that I said that. No, 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 no. Okay. Um. Uh, Hi, Rahul. Hello, sir. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Hi Rahul. Rahul. Hi, sir. Hi. Okay. So, um, I think it's six o'clock. I think we should start on time so everybody no, gets a, a chance. Uh, Yes, yes, Girish. I uh, Jesh, go ahead. Okay, sir. So is my screen visible now? Yes. Okay. <coughs> so, good evening, delegates, and good evening, all the participants. I myself, Jayesh Murlidhar Kasagod from Olympic Marketing Division. I take this opportunity to welcome you all in the Open X program. It's an interface among orthopedic doctors for knowledge sharing. today we are going to have in cme uh, this this discussion and for the same we have uh, dr pradeep munot as a moderator with us who is an executive member for aofas as well as joint secretary for ifas and is also working as a senior foot and ankle surgeon in mumbai i would also like to welcome the eminent panelists from the orthopedic uh, society we have dr anish karadia sir who is from university of michigan usa who works as an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery there i welcome you sir and i be also of the karthik gariyaran sir who is a consultant trauma and foot and ankle surgeon in royal bengal hospital in united kingdom we also have eminent case presenters for today's session from all over india uh, we have dr kumar santunanan from patna we have dr girish motwani sir from nagpur yeah, from sorry to pause we have dr mahesh soni with us we have dr rahul upadhyay sir from jaipur from ahmedabad we have dr parth parekh and uh, unfortunately we are not having today abhijit bande padhe sir due to the cyclone thing but we take this opportunity to also you know uh, thank him for this uh, uh, session <laughs> apart from that delhi we uh, from delhi we have dr inderjit singh with us dr k rao from hyderabad and last but not the least we have dr kapil saudi sir from maharashtra so i take this opportunity to welcome all the uh, eminent case presenters panelists and moderators and without further ado I'd like to hand over the session to Dr. Pradeep Bhunot sir. Over to you sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, Girish. Hi, welcome. Hello, sir. Hi. Um, am I audible? To... Yes, 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 you yes, are. Yes, you Girish. are. You are. Great. Okay. Great um, to have you, Girish. Hi, Dr. Girish. Same here, sir. How are you? Fine. <laughs> okay. uh two things first of all there's no financial stuff involved in this webinar we am not getting paid anything neither of uh, the panelists the presenters or myself from this um alambic is just being hosting these uh, webinar so that's one thing very clear uh second thing is anish kadake is not from michigan he is from chicago a professor at uh, the university hospital there and kumar shantanu is from pune and not from patna sorry apologies for that uh without wasting time uh, handing over to shantanu uh, for the cases right so i guess i'll do the screen sharing yes please yes so there we go so is my screen visible to all yes yeah all right so here i go i shall be presenting a case of uh, a uh, neglected trauma of ankle this was a 33 uh, 63 year old male diabetic with poor diabetic control presenting to me on 26th of february this year with a history of index injury on 25th of september 2017 so the original injury was 2 years and 5 months before he presented to me all this while initially he was treated conservatively in cast elsewhere oh. he always had some difficulty in walking ever since and then he was managing somehow but suddenly his ankle gave way on its own 3 weeks back that was somewhere in the beginning of 
the month of February this year. On examination, there was varus deformity and there was painless abnormal mobility at the ankle joint. I just show you. So this is what I could record on examination. The foot was in varus and further varus was possible. And it was a painless abnormal mobility, mind, painless abnormal mobility, right? And he also brought two x-rays. The first x-ray on your left is a, is a foot, AP and oblique view, done two days after the index injury, where you could see there is some fracture of the calcaneus. Somebody has put a mark on that as well. And since he was consulting off and on, he also had a x-ray where there was a neglected ankle joint fracture, but the displacement wasn't there. And then I got his x-ray done. And this was the x-ray. You could see that there is a neglected trimolar fracture. There's gross destruction of the articular area. There's gross secondary osteoarthritis of the ankle joint. We can also see a little bit of uh, osteoarthritis in the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. And there is heel calcaneus fracture, which was there in the first x-ray. So what are our treatment aims? Of course, we have to give a painless stable ankle for normal gait and ambulation. So what are the options? Naturally, no place for conservative. We have to do some kind of surgery. With this kind of bad x-ray and with the, the sword of uh, diabetes hanging on our head, I really cannot think of any osteosynthesis in such a bad ankle. So we had to go for arthrodesis. Now the question is, what kind of arthrodesis? Whether just the ankle or the ankle, ankle plus subtalar? And if at all, then what implant? The screws, plates, or nail. So on milling about all these factors. 30 seconds left to present. Yeah, this, is, this is what we did. Ankle joint preparation, subtalar joint, screw metallism, calcaneus, and we did this TTC nail. And this is his latest X-ray. We can see that the deformity is corrected and the patient is progressing well. Thank you so much. I hope I have finished in, uh, in time well. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Case is open for discussion. Hand over to Anish and uh, Karthik. Uh, go for it, Anish. Okay. So that's a tough case, you know. I think what you said are in the case is absolutely correct. If you try to do an aura RIF of this case, you're asking for a ton of trouble, even though sometimes it seems appealing. Even after three, four months in this type of painless Charcot diabetic, you're always better off with the fusion than you are trying to fix this case if it's neglected. You know, it seems right. elegant to do an ankle fusion isolated in this case, but I've done that as well. What is, happens is I think the subtalar joint, tan joint will, even though mobility is good, a lot of times you get deformity again through the hind foot. And this guy had calcaneus fracture. I think TTC with the nail, is a fantastic idea. The plates can be used too. And I've done TTC with the lateral plate. The only yeah. downside is you have to strip all the way up the, the lateral side of the tibia to get the plate on. And I think that devascularizes that anterolateral tibia sometimes because of the perineal artery. And you can see here in your case, you do not have to strip the perineal artery that much because you use a nail. So I think right. you did a great job. And just keep in mind that the lateral play for TTC does cause a lot of devascularization. That's my yeah. answer. Great. Okay. Uh, interesting and, and uh, a very well um, treated patient. A couple of things just for people who are looking at this. Well, I mean, this is a well and uh, truly a, uh, a shock. Okay. There's, there's almost no doubt about it. This is a, this is a shock arthropathy. And we need to recognize that there are issues of vascularity in diabetes. And so you, we need to have a careful assessment of vascularity, possibly with a Doppler, just to ensure that you've got good vascularity, because that is almost the fundamental basis on which uh, you conduct a fusion. You know, you need nutrition to conduct a fusion. The second thing is, I mean, I'm not, this is just uh, not, not even a critique. These are suggestions as to how I do them. It is very important to have a long, stable segment, okay? So I think what you've done is absolutely right. You've gone past the isthmus of the tibia because the next thing that'll happen is you'll have a, a stress fracture at the isthmus. So I'm glad you've actually gone past the isthmus with your nail. So using a long nail is a good idea. If you don't have access to a long ankle nail, 
what which which is for, which is for me uh, that's the situation i don't have access to a long uh, ankle specific nail i use a short ankle nail but almost invariably will use an uh, a circular wire fixator externally so that i can get the patient to walk on it because a diabetic will walk on it whether you tell him not to or you tell him to he, he's going to put some weight in it partial weight bearing doesn't work with a diabetic because he can't feel it so that is point number two. Point number three is you've taken the fibula out. And for me, yeah. the fibula is extremely useful because I do a RAF type fusion where I fix the fibula onto the lateral side of the, the, the arthrodesis uh, construct. And it works as a remarkably good restraint against uh, uh, movement of the fusion side. Exactly. That's exactly where it is. And, you know, the fibula is, is your friend. I used to pick them up and mulch them up and put them in as graft. But now I take graft either from the proximal tibia or from the oscalsis itself. But I keep the fibula so that I can use that as a lateral strut graft. And it really does make a huge difference, particularly in patients with charcoal or where situations where you think you might have a problem with nutrition and vascularity. This acts as, you know, because you're, you're opening the fibula out. This, the fibula osteotomy has already been done for you. You know, I don't know whether... The, the fragment was big enough for you to use. But if you've got a reasonable length of fibula, I think it's a, it's a wonderful added adjunct to the stability of the, the, the construct. So one question, can I ask a question here? Yes, Shantaru. Right, so if we keep the fibula here and use it as a strut, which I think a few of my friends also suggested me, uh, I would be putting a screw from this way, another screw from this way. Correct. So I was... I was, since he was diabetic, I, the idea in my mind was to use as less hardware as possible. I was, uh, uh, it's not, it's not essential for you to use it. This is just an adjunct. I mean, you've, you've done a beautiful job. The, the, the fusion almost looks healed up. There's only one little question for me. Now, sure. again, uh, Shantanu, this is just looking at the x-rays. There is a halo around the posterior to anterior screw. And I'm just a little nervous that the construct is a little loose. Uh, just need you to be careful with this yeah. guy with, with uh, mobilization. If you take, him, take off his plaster and his boot and say, yeah, it's all healed up, walk on it. Just be very careful. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Um, just wanted to add one or two things. Um, and especially uh, one question before that to uh, Karthik and Anish. Now, Karthik, I know you like long uh, nails and... You know, we have done quite a few of this. I've done quite a few of these. The problem with if you use very long nails, yes, you should pass through the isthmus. But I think the nail just about should pass the isthmus. If yeah. you use too long, the problem is too, which I find. If you if you are just away of your entry point, yeah, you're I, I, way I, off on the proximal side, then correct. you would have a stress fracture or an intra fracture. So Agreed. I have actually gone from long to short to the middle where I just pass the isthmus. That's one oh. part I do. I, I don't second... pass the isthmus at all. I just use a, <laughs> I just use a circular frame fixator ah, for diabetes. Okay. For yeah. diabetes. I put the nail yes. in, a short nail in, and I put a fixator on. Okay. Second thing is, uh, Shantanu, why did you take so much of fibula off? Means if you go and look at the pre-op x-rays, there's not too much of a loss, effectively a bone loss. There is still talus left. There is still the distal tibia left. And of course, your yes, subtalar joint is it. Why did you have to take so much? And you could have just taken your lateral malleolus fragment, which was the fractured one. Uh, any reason why you took so much of fibula as well? Yes, uh, in hindsight, your question is absolutely perfect. Probably I should have kept a little bit of more there. But only thing was I wanted a good exposure. I wanted to debride it, sort of, sort of debride it and make sure that my arthrodesis is proper. And I also okay. have a long, but yes. I think next time if I go and do the same case, I'll take a little less of fibula and also probably use it as a strut because I was discussing this case with two other of my colleagues and they have the same thing to say. Can I, can I make two yes, very quick it. points? I'm sorry. Yeah. This is, these are really for trainees or any junior doctors who are looking at this. One is, Shantanu, did you use a Tony K? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the one thing that, uh, that I have gone away from. I don't use a tonique in these patients, only because of the calcification of the, the vessels. I'm always very nervous about doing that. I don't know about Anish. I don't use a tonique for diabetes. In fact, I don't use a tonique for 
many of the uh, the ankle fusions that I do because I think you can you can get good hemostasis as you go in, and it's always nice to see, particularly in AVN, etc. Nice to see where you're bleeding from and where you're not. The second thing is is a pet allergy of mine, and you know I know many of you would disagree with me. I absolutely loathe the idea of skin clips. <laughs> I, I, have, I have no shares in in, uh, in suture companies, but I find the concept of putting skin clips uh, really abhorrent. And I flay my trainees and say, don't you ever dare use a clip in my practice. I might just be an old fashioned, stubborn little bugger. But you know, if you looked at the, uh, the history of clips, I think uh, we all know that there have been significant wound problems, particularly in the lower limb arising from clips. But look at your wound, bloody hell, you've, you've proved me wrong. But as a general philosophy, <laughs> I don't use I don't use clips. I don't know what about you, Adish? Well, I, I don't use clips because I think it's a sign of laziness. The patients <laughs> think that. But yeah. on, on the other hand, my partner, who's thirty years in practice, uses clips all the time, and the wounds <laughs> are the same. But I I plus I don't close the wound, so I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I use subcuticular suture, and uh, yeah. you know, but but look at this wound. This wound looks beautiful. It looks great. So I. I I think yeah, it makes a real difference, but I don't use a tourniquet at all anymore. The last five years, so that uh, professor assistant was back in eight years ago now. So I'm at Northwestern now, but I stopped using tourniquet maybe five years ago for every case. I have no yep. tourniquet in any case, and I really think the wound complication yep. uh, and fusion rate, osteotomy healing, my complication rate has gotten gotten way smaller. Yeah, I mean the publishing on our fusion rates now, and they're. I have biology I use as well, but I really think the tourniquet is a huge detriment to what we do. And if you do the hemostasis, when you get in there, it takes extra five minutes. Yeah. It's no big but deep knows. I mean, he was there. It, we just don't use tourniquet. Good. I think it's a big, big relevant thing. Yeah. Um, and for the nail, I actually don't use the long nail as much. I, but if you're going to use a shorter nail, because I cast these people for months yeah. and then I put them in an AFO for a full year. You want to make sure what everybody said is correct. Yes. You go short or you go long, but never go in the middle. That's the mistake. If you go just proximal to the isthmus or just at the isthmus, it'll fracture. So bypass like um, was done here or go short and then just cast them if you want. And I cast the hell out of these people for three months and then put them oh, in an too. AFO. Me too. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Last question. Sorry. I... When, oh, would you go... when would you go on the medial side in these kind of cases? Karthik and Anish. All the time. On the I medial like side, medial uh, side exposure? Exclusively? Exclusively no. medial side? Including the lateral? No, very, very, very often, 90% of the time, I will always make a small incision medially. Okay. Because I want Anish. to clear the medial gutter, especially if the medial malleolus is intact. You strip a lot more trying to sort of climb over the tibia all the way into the medial gutter. So almost always I will do a medial, a small medial incision because it reduces <coughs> my stripping. And many of these, particularly of with uh, Charcot, many of these, you can actually do them beautifully after script click. Because the deformity is very mobile, you can actually do them very well. The only deterrent to that is in a TTC nail where you have to medialize the oscalsis to get your nail in the middle, which you can't do after script click. It's really difficult to do. So when you prep, uh, you, you want to move the, the oscalsis. If your subtalar joint is also involved in the deformity, you can't, I mean, at least I can't, use an arthroscope. But with, with a situation like this, where the heel is pretty much neutral, I think it's actually very easy to minimize your exposure by, because you don't need to carve out those bits of bone that are lying around. They, they'll quite happily sort of hang in there whilst the main body of the fusion continues to progress. Uh, this is just a thought. I don't know about Anish, but uh, I certainly do use uh, the arthroscope quite uh, generously. Okay. I'm not an arthroscopist as much, but I, I do go medial because you have to get, the, just like Karthik said, you have to medialize that talus. Yep. And a lot of times this deformity is very flexible, but with any rigidity, you will suffer by not making a small incision. I will just osteotomize the medial mal to make sure I can line everything up. I don't strip everything. I think it's very important. Small incision, osteotomy mal, clean out the gutter, small incision, don't strip it all. Do the bulk of it work laterally. But if you don't go medially, a lot of times you can't get that ankle Maybe. straight. And you can't get okay. the ankle down the fairway. No, no chance. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shantanu. Fantastic case. Uh, please uh, stop sharing this uh, the screen. Girish, 
yes, you're sir. on. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, so here is a one more interesting case. Yesterday I saw the message that the presenter time is five minutes, and today I saw that it's three minutes. So it's little mismatch for me. Anyway, I will try my best to to cover my case in five three minutes. Am I audible to everyone? Yes. 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 Yeah. So here is a, a neglected six weeks old SCR uh, uh, stage four uh, fracture. So this was a fracture, twisting foot injury. Sixty year old male. Uh, patient has been uh, treated by the cast. I don't know for what reason, by the another orthopedic surgeon, and uh, there is no history of any diabetes or the comorbid condition. Uh, patient came to me after five weeks of cast. On six week, he has removed the cast, started walking without medical advice, and this was a deformity which I found the plano valgus foot deformity, which was a new onset. There was a lot of tenderness around the deltoid and the lateral malleolus. <clears throat> The, uh, the range of motion was restricted. Definitely, there was no neuropathy, and patient was having a lot of pain. Uh, so this was a weight-bearing X-ray when I got at six weeks of the injury, uh, and this is a medial clear space opening. I was almost 8.5 mm. Uh, I got a CT scan. The CT was showing uh, uh, a better evaluation of this uh, fracture pattern, which was definitely showing an anterior syndesmotic widening. Uh, there was a posterior malleus fracture, probably the intercalary fragment of the os or the or the callus formation at the at the region of the posterior malleus. There was definitely widening at the medial clear space and the uniting uh, uh, oblique fracture of the fibula. So I I I gone that uh, posterolateral approach, which is uh, the workhorse for for these uh, fractures, and I did a lateral fibular plating. Uh, after the lateral fibular stabilization, I did a external rotation stress view. Obviously, there would be the widening of the medial clear space because the the, uh, the posterior malleus was not fixed. But at least I got information that the, this medial clear space is reducible and it is flexible. Uh, so I did a second step. I did a posterior malleus fixation by the buttress plate. And uh, after the, uh, the posterior malleus fixation, again, I found that the medial clear space was still not reduced. Uh, in 2016, we were not very keen of doing uh, direct deltoid repair. So we were trying trying to do a lot of uh, deltoid uh, uh, repair indirect by the surrogate fixation by the syndesmotic screw. The same thing I did here. So with the application of the clamp, I got a good closure of the medial clear space. I've not went medially, but interoperatively, I had a subjective feeling that I am I'm giving a lot of force to the clamping. And my force of the clamping is probably too high. Anyway, I, I accepted that force and I, I, I fixed this ankle with a two syndesmotic screw. But again, in, in the immediate, uh, in the, at the end of the procedure, I was not happy with the medial clear space because I don't know how much is too much for this uh, medial clear space widening. I was, this was not acceptable. I went medially, I took out this uh, syndesmotic screw. There was a lot of fibrotic tissue. There was a lot of damage to the superficial and the deep deltoid obviously was there. But on the top of that, there was a subluxated tibialis posterior tendon. It was ballotable tendon. It was going inside the middle malus. It was going outside the middle malus. And probably there was associated with the rupture of the flexor retinaculum as well. So there's the same kind of repair which we do for the peroneal tendon. So I will not, I will not go in the details. So osteoperiosteal sleeve formation, uh, retromalar groove deepening, and reposition of the tibialis posterior tendon. And repair of the flexor uh, retinaculum and the uh, deltoid using the transosseous bony tunnel because I was not prepared for the suture anchor. I was not prepared for the deltoid opening. Finally, at the end of the procedure, I got a good reduction of the medial clear space. Everything was visible to me. I was a little satisfied. Uh, the medial clear space was almost e equivalent to the superior. And this is six months follow-up with a good range of motion, good closure at the medial clear space, fracture united, and patient walking uh, pain-free. So my learning points, uh, uh, you have to be very re be ready for any bony and the soft tissue challenges. Pre-operative planning is must. Medial exploration almost always, if there is any doubt in the medial clear space widening, Keep all the implants ready intraoperatively when you are treated neglected and a lot of ankle can be preserved with the good balancing of the ligaments. Uh, so these are some memories from 
uh, Chicago, 2016 visit and 19 recently six months bed. So probably we have enjoyed a pre-corona period with Dr. Anish. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very good case. Open for discussion. Uh, Karthik. Yes, Let's start. Uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful disposition. Uh, uh, the ability to say, look, I'm not happy. Let's go back. Let's do it again. I think that is the hallmark of a perfectionist and very well done, Girish. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the components of the injury are you've got a lateral malleolar fracture, you've got a full house syndesmotic injury with avulsion of the posterior malleolus. I suspect that's a Haraguchi 2 or the new Mason classification 5. Uh, and you've got the deltoid ligament. So you've got a full house SER4 injury. And it is imperative that we pay attention to all of them. Uh, of course, the, the question of uh, deltoid repair is contentious in the acute stage. But given the fact that you've got a well-established, very large clear space, what I suspect I would have done slightly differently was I would have done exactly as you had done, repositioned the syndesmosis after sort of pulling the uh, uh, posterior malleolus back into position, fixed the fibula. But before I did that, I would have probably opened the medial uh, yeah. gutter in any case to clear out the tissue because if for six weeks there was bound to be organizing material in there and you might have found that you probably didn't need to acutely repair the deltoid although at six weeks I think we'll have to be a bit careful you know people say just cobble everything up but if you try and do that I think you'll you'll struggle to get to the the deep deltoid you can't repair the deep deltoid as you know it's almost impossible to yeah so I think what you did the transosseous repair what did you use so I use well, the pro proline stage because this was the oh, only thing available. Okay, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I have, I have done various things. I've taken FDL and 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 used it. It's very close. It's in the vicinity, and it's actually quite easy to use. But now I use the internal brace. I mean, it's uh, it's my lifesaver. You can do a two-tailed internal brace fixation of the medial deltoid, one to the oscalcis and the other to the navicular, and it works really, really well. But you've done perfectly well. A proline stitch, you know, is non-absorbable and. Uh, as long as you don't get an inflammatory reaction, you'd be absolutely fine. There's only one question I want to ask you. If you hold on to that x-ray, are you completely happy that you have lengthened out your fibula to the, to the required level? If you look to the talocrural angle there, the, uh, you know, the, I can't see a, a proper dime sign. Uh, you know, this is yeah. not a mortis so, view. So yeah, I, I don't is... know whether there was still some residual shortening. Again, look, uh, I'm not criticizing anything. This is a fantastic job. I'm just throwing I questions think, uh, into the equation. Yeah, so I think it's probably a view but problem. View both problem, are the, uh, the non-weight bearing x-rays and none of okay. the x-rays mortise. The case was from 2016. Okay. And this is like the, uh, the x-ray which, which say that I have I've achieved the fibula length exactly up to the lat maximum up to the lateral dollar process. Okay, and uh, intro okay yeah. that's fine. Yeah. I can see that now. Okay, okay. Good. Anish? No, I think you did a great job, man. I think going, not just leaving it with screws that have crushed the mortise is a very important take home point. It's a very common mistake that is made. You really need no pressure to reduce the syndesmosis. Most data now suggests that you can just use the thumb and there's data that shows the thumb reduction is superior to the clamp. So if you find yourself needing a clamp to reduce the syndesmosis and it won't just go, that's a sign that Girish rightly did realize something is wrong go medial i'm a big medial fan yeah. i've never seen the posture tip out of its groove yeah. in a tooth fracture i think that's fascinating Unexpected. i've only seen it once in a non-fracture situation and you do exactly what you did is perfect the only difference i would have done is i would have put the patient prone likely from the beginning though lateral to get to the post lateral aspect is fine but i would have preferred a posterior plate on the fibula because if you look at your lateral x-ray pre-op, he already was posterior lateral subluxated because of your um, posterior malleolus fragment. And so if his bone quality is no good, if you go to that CT on the right, go to the next slide, uh, This, the one after this, on the right side, your CT, it shows that the fibula is, is apex anterior angulated here on the right side. Yeah. And you want to make sure that, in my opinion, if the bone quality is no good, it's been six weeks, you put a nice solid posterior lateral plate on, that almost, not guarantees, but makes it very um, easy to get length back because yeah. it's hard to get a short fibula when the plate's on the back. And it's hard to get a read at six, seven weeks. 
And then it minimizes the fact that the fibula is going to malreduce posteriorly if you don't have great bone quality. It's the easy access to the posterior malleolus. However, the medial side is way harder if you go prone. I have a lot of people yeah. that can move the foot for me, so it's easy. Or you can flip the patient, whatever you want to do. But if you go straight lateral, same approach, just elevate the bed and just go straight lateral. And that's one thing is I would have gone posterior lateral. Um, and for sure, like Karthik said, go for the deltoid. And this is now hindsight. But what you did, your outcome is phenomenal. And the biggest thing is you were not accepting something that was a C grade. You made it an A grade, even though it took you more time, more effort. But that was 100% the right thing to do. I mean, it's a great job. And the concepts that you taught are perfect. All four, you know, the ankles are 360. Medial mal, deltoid, posterior mal, lateral mal, syndesmosis, and cheerily. That's how you think of an ankle fracture. All four have to be reconstructed, yeah. in my opinion, to give rotational and angular stability. And you did the right, that's that's how you think about it now. Okay, so I know everybody's been trying to be good, good to Girish, but can, would Anish and uh, Karthik to uh, ask you the question, should you, should he had started first posterior malleolus, then lateral, and then check for the medial clear space, and then check its endosmosis, would that be the order you would do it? Well, the, the one thing I've learned uh, is never fix anything. Temporarily hold everything, check your syndesmotic stability, check your medial clear space, and then start fixing. But as Anish said, always hit the medial side, open the medial side, clear the okay. medial side, and then you'll know whether your syndesmosis just flops into the incisura fibularis, or whether you're going to have to crush it if you're going to have to crush it, you're shoving the talus up against the medial malleolus, crushing all the organizing fibrous tissue there. So I always only temporarily fix everything because once I've put all my screws in, I think, yeah. oh shit, I, you know, I've now got to take them all out. And that's the reason why I only temporarily fix all of them. But I, I think once you've got the length of the lateral malleolus out of length, I almost always head for the posterior mal because I want to get the fibula into the uh, incisura and stabilize that with fixing and tensioning of the PITFL. Okay, so the, the philosophy is you want to get that construct nice and stable, but in order to do that, you need to be sure that you can rotate the talus back into the medial gutter, which is why you need to open the medial side very early on to clear out the debris. You can, again, I'm just being anally retentive about this. You can do this through an arthroscope, uh, and I have done it through an arthroscope, but you know, it's just laborious. And when, when you have, when you think in terms of it, you, it takes you five minutes to open and clear the medial side. So you're probably better off doing it that way. Okay. Anything to add, Anish? Yeah, I think your point is correct. And these malunions and an acute fracture, you can start fixing and lateral yeah. side and not worry about the medial side to the end. But in a chronic situation, your life is much better by knowing you have to go medial. So loosen everything, go medial, clean out the gutter. So you're not fighting yourself as you're trying to reduce the lateral side, loosen the post mal. Then reduce the fibula, K-wire, same thing, go after the posture mount, and those two work in concert. Yeah. But you have to have that medial side open. It would have been easier probably, I mean, Gary did a great job, but it would have been easier, and now in hindsight, more logical to go medial to clean it out so the talus has a place to go. Yeah. You're not fighting yourself the whole time. Then it's all loose, syndesmosis is loose because it's chronic. Then reduce everything, posture mount, lateral mount together. I fix posture mal first with the plate, then lateral mal with the plate, then deltoid, and then syndesmosis. That's the order of how I fix it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Girish, for excellent discussion. And thank you. Uh, please stop sharing your screen. Thank you, sir. May I ask uh, Dr. Mahesh Soni? Girish, please stop sharing. Yes, sir. Mahesh, all yours. So as everybody knows, Mahesh is from Ankleshwar. And if you are a part of the IFAS, it means he, he produces some amazing stuff. And yes. he's almost like a perfectionist. If you look at his x-rays, it looks like it's coming out from a book. That's what he is. Okay, Mahesh, all yours. Please unmute yourself. Mahesh. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So thanks for the compliments. Uh, and uh, good evening to all. 
So this is a case uh, uh, I did uh, about five years ago. So young chap uh, presented in a uh, night hours with this injury. So open wound, uh, as you can see, these are the injury X-rays. So you can see here a comminuted fibula with fractured talus with open wound on the medial side. Deltoid was uh, uh, looking at me. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So, start moving. Okay. So, this is the x ray. Uh, you can see the comminuted fibula with fractured talus. So, this, this was fixed in my, uh, miss, five years ago, I was not that much competent, I think, to handle this ankle injury. This was my first, uh, means, uh, I attended EFOS uh, uh, in the meantime, 2016. And I learned a lot from the EFOS. So this was my case. I did very badly. Early morning, this case was done by me. Tellus was fixed by two, CC, uh, two Herbert screws. Ebola was probably not fixed. Uh, full length was not, at, not at achieved. And uh, here you can see the telox fragment. It was fixed uh, in a closed mirror. The ankle joint was not opened. In the meantime, uh, the patient started some discharge from the medial wound. The follow-up X-ray was taken on uh, 5 and 2016. The discharge was continued. There was some shifting of the mortise, and there is some sign of infection probably here. Again, the follow-up X-ray, uh, the wound was still discharging. There was persistent gap on the medial side. Patient was complaining of the pain. He was not able to walk. And I, I allowed a full weight bearing at that time. He was walking with the support. So uh, till that uh, period, it is about five months post-injury. The infection was continued. He was on the antibiotic. Finally, I did this. I removed the implants. And the orthodesis was done in this manner. Uh, I used a screw at that time. The fibula was, uh, the part of the fibula was used uh, to get arthrodesis and two transfix screws were placed, CC screws. This is the follow-up x-ray on 13 4, 2017. Little bit longer screw on the medial side, as you can see. This is a recent follow-up on 5 9, 2019. The patient is walking, the arthrodesis is united, but there is pain on walking. As you can see the next x-ray, the standing x-ray, you can see the valgus here. You can see the uh, valgus heel. This is scar, anterior wound. This is a get video of the patient. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can yeah. hear you. Yes. So this is almost uh, two and a half years, uh, uh, five years follow up. This is the, the video was uh, taken just the day before yesterday. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, Anish. So this is a tough case, you know, I think uh, it's a bad high energy fracture, right? Tailless, open medial side. And you tried, you give you a lot of credit, Mahesh, for saying you didn't do a great job in the beginning. It takes a big man to admit that. Yes. Um, and I think we all make that mistake. And so I think now as we're older, the best thing to do when you have a high energy, bad soft tissue is just X-fix, which I think is the right thing to do now. You X-fix, wash out the ankle joint. You know, we all get so excited to fix a talus early, 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 but none of that matters if you get infection, AVN. And there's nice data out of Seattle that shows it doesn't matter how early you fix the talus. I would have, in, in hindsight, X-fix, soft tissue wash out one, two times, I'm aggressive, make sure it heals. Then after two weeks, because you've got it out to length, then you can do a large lateral approach. It's a tough case because a lot of bone missing. So it would be some sort of pre-contoured plate if possible. If not, an LCDCP plate, as thick as it might be, may be required, but pre-contoured, I think everyone has available. Laterally, bone graft. 
In this type of a case, I actually acutely do a synostosis from the fibula to the tibia because there's nothing there. You're trying to hold that buttress. Immediately you could, if the soft tissue was perfect, repair the deltoid, but I'm a little cautious on deltoid repair and these nasty fractures. Reduce the talus and fix it like you did is fine, I think, as long as you have it reduced, because you can see the whole thing because it would be dislocated. So before you fix the fibula, fix the talus. However you want, this is infected AVN is different. You fix the talus with screws because it's a, uh, a sagittal split. And then synostosis distally in that area where there's no bone to try to get that to heal because your medial side of fixation is going to be compromised heavily. And that's what I would have done ideally. In hindsight, for the fusion, if it came to me after I did the same thing and if it was infected, the fusion with screws can be done. But in this case, his tendency is to go into valgus. So I would have preferred a lateral plate to stop him from going into valgus and put the buttress on the lateral side. And then okay. maybe a medial screw as well. Now okay, I wouldn't sure. touch it. Show the next x-ray, Mahesh. Next, yes. the latest x-ray. Yeah. Yeah, just stop there. Okay. I think that's where we are now. Uh, yeah. uh, Karthik. Okay. Well, I mean, it's um, it's a tough case. There's no doubt about it. And I go back to the, the current cliche. We know that staged soft tissue protocols improve the outcomes of these open injuries dramatically. Dramatically. There's been a multi-center study which shows that, you know, the usual which now currently is starting to become a disgusting cliche is pan scan plan. Okay. Again, this is for the benefit of general orthopedic surgeons. Always, always span them. Even if they, if, if it is a massive open injury with lots of bone uh, comminution, I think if you span them, you would give that's first aid for the soft tissue. Let's leave aside all of that. You've got, if you looked at your original injury x ray, what you can also see is you see the tilor fragment, but I think there's yeah. also a lateral compression fragment of the distal tibia. So uh, even I, if I, the uh, talus had healed up nicely, I think it was it was it was always going to head into into valgus because I think there is a lateral crush. If you look at the oh, there you go. So you can see that on your on your metal work, you can see that there is a lateral crush injury. So the lateral compression uh, uh, component, if you Look at the uh, Eastwood Atkins classification of pylon fractures. This is one version of it, and it's almost universally associated with a poor prognosis because it's very difficult to reconstruct that lateral crush of the uh, of the tibia. Now, if you go back to what the car the the uh, the next slide actually, if you go back to the next slide, what you can see no, if you go back to the previous one, I beg your pardon, previous one, you can see that immediate post fracture fixation, the uh, post uh, fusion. Uh, x-rays, you can see that the fusion has happened in valgus. Okay, if you looked at the, the heel, the heel is already in valgus at the time of uh, fusion. So it's a malunion of an ankle fusion. So if you go back to can the Can I just stop you that, Karthik? Yeah, Karthik, yeah, can sure. I just, on that sure. same thing, I just want to ask Mahesh. Mahesh, how did you do this ankle fusion? Did you take an anterior approach or a lateral approach? Double approach. Uh, for, was, first approach was already there, fibular plate removal, so lateral approach. And the anterior approach was taken to prevent the medial gutter as well as the uh, anterior joint surface. Okay. Yeah. Karthi, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So the second thing that I may have considered doing at that time when you did your ankle fusion was possibly to do a subtalar fusion, do a TTC fusion. And as Anish said, using a lateral buttress or an intermedullary device to try and hold the construct together. That might have prevented the, the malunion in valgus. So the question is, this guy's come back to you. It's got a solid ankle fusion, which is remarkable considering that he's got AVN, and they usually fuse reasonably well. The question yeah, this is, this patient is complaining. Yeah, pardon me. This patient is complaining of pain on the lateral side right now while walking. Okay. okay. So if I, if you and can show me the latest the X-rays, uh, this yeah. is almost certainly as a result of subfibular impingement. I would suspect. Okay. He probably has got yeah. subfibular impingement because the the, the heel is in significant valgus. Now, it's a daunting prospect for you to take down that ankle fusion. I think that's a, it's a terrifying prospect, and it's something that I probably wouldn't consider doing. My, my inclination is that this guy's got good vascularity. He's not a smoker. He's not a diabetic. And he is a, a reasonably motivated chap who wants to get back to normality of any sort. I would do, I would do two things in combination, mainly because if you can remove all the, the metal work without too much disruption, just you know, um, um, percutaneous 
little stab incisions to hopefully try and take all the bits of metal out, except for the, the broken fragment you can leave in there. You can actually do minimally invasive supramalleolar osteotomy and the medializing calcaneal osteotomy, and you can get the whole construct nicely reorganized, and that will relieve him of that uh, uh, the uh, subfibular impingement. You may have to make a little incision and clear out that subfibular space, but this is perfectly suitable for a you know, minimally invasive small incision. When I use a bird, I use just a, a three millimeter incision, but this would be perfect for something which you can do a small approach. You can even do a medial approach and do a closing wedge because it'll make it much more stable. But I think this will be the perfect patient as long as there are no significant comorbidities and the chap is motivated enough. This would be a great case to do that. So Karthik, if you do a supramalleolar osteotomy, so you yeah. do a supramalleolar, probably what, correct? With your three millimeter, you're probably getting a three to five mm correction, three to five uh, degree of correction, right? No, no, I, I, I use a lateral opening wedge. I put a frame on. Ah. <laughs> I simply, I open everything up. I lengthen, I open everything up and it, and it, and it looks, it, it's beautiful. And you can get 40 degrees of correction if you want. No, but with this, with this, so coming to this case, when you said, you say take a small incision, Take yeah. a small medial closing wedge osteotomy. Correct. That is okay. if you don't don't use a frame, you don't use. Yes, we uh, don't slow, use a frame. Yeah, for yeah. for imbecile slagayas, we probably no, no, yeah. don't. Come on, no imbecile <laughs> no, business. Yeah. No, no, no. So that's fine. So you do a closing wedge. You probably put some screws or you can put a plate. Yeah. Then how do you decide how much you do a medial shift of your calcaneum osteotomy? Uh, whatever is residual, you know, okay. you should be able to get twenty degrees or even more. If, if you take a reasonable wedge on the medial side uh, and whatever is residual, you can, you can correct using a calcaneal osteotomy. You don't want to shorten the, uh, the, the tibia too much. You, know, you don't want to really twist it over because all the, the mechanics of the long tendons will start to get affected if you really twist it too much. There are some people who'd say, well, why don't you just do a dome osteotomy? I find that's a terrible osteotomy for me. I really struggle with that. Uh, it's difficult to do. It's difficult to, to create. It takes a big incision, and I, I struggle with the, with the dome. But you can do the dome and use just the one osteotomy and twist it in. But if you do both, because I'm almost certain that having walked on a valgus subtalar joint, there's likely to be a problem with the subtalar axis as well. And so by doing a medializing uh, calc, you're also correcting heel strike. That's, what about... That's, yeah. What about just doing a subtalar... Because we already said you could have all also could have done a TTC fusion before. So why not just do now a subtalar fusion you and, you correct, and you just correct that valgus? Yes, no, you absolutely. There, there, there is no, I find correcting valgus uh, through a subtalar uh, fusion sometimes quite daunting because you, you know, if you want to do that, I think you'd have to go medially. Uh, and I try and avoid fusing the subtalar joint in a situation such as this, if I can, get away with a medializing calc. It's a far, far easier operation. Okay. Anish, any thoughts? Yeah, I don't think you can try to do this with a subtalar fusion unless you close yeah. it down immediately. You will be yeah, surely disappointed through a standard approach and a medial closing wedge oh, subtalar man. osteotomy may sound good on paper. <laughs> yes. It's extremely difficult in reality. Yeah. I'm not as good as Karthik for a frame. I don't have that skill. So I would do a medial, if this guy really complained, I'd do a medial closing wedge tibial osteotomy. And I played it. That's how I fix things. Take out all the hard rocks. See, then, you know, the subtalar joint, I think an MDCO is probably okay. You get a CT to make sure, right? If yeah. the CT to the subtalar joint is shot, then fine. Do the medial closing wedge and a subtalar fusion. But if it's not shot, then you can do an MDCO after you do the, the uh, medial closing wedge. And don't overcorrect it to varus. You're not yeah. creating a varus ankle. Don't look crazy. <laughs> Just trying to align the axis. And remember now, it's been four years, five years his entire forefoot's going to be abnormally compensated. Yep. So you're going to have to do either a cotton osteotomy or TMT subfusion. Try not to fuse more, so hopefully just cotton to yep. plantar flex the medial column. I wouldn't do any deltoid spring ligament reconstruction. You're probably getting too fancy, but probably need a cotton when you're done yep. to plantar flex the medial column. Um, and I think the big lesson is don't try to compensate through the subtalar joint fusion for the ankle valgus because unless you close it yep. through the subtalar fusion, you, in this case, you'll be in a lot of, you'll just have a crappier ankle now. Again, it'll be still be in valgus. No, but what, what about putting a, a trapezoidal bone graft in the no. subtalar joint and no. you can, no, it will just, not work? Let's just go back to 
the basic uh, uh, pathoanatomy, okay? So if you try and crank out from the outside, you'll have two problems. One is you, you'll really struggle to close the wound because your, the, the lateral stress on the skin is enormous. Mm -hmm. And secondly, remember, this is not a varus deformity. This is a varus internal rotation or a, a sorry, valgus deformity. It's a, it's a valgus external rotation. So the, the oscalsis is externally rotated here. And you, and, you know, the correction of the deformity should be by internally rotating it. The deformity per se lies at the ankle joint. Ankle joint is fused in, in valgus. So you can't try and compensate that by trying to crank it open from the lateral side because your heel strike will be completely off, off kilter. And, and if you try and do that, you will supinate the forefoot so enormously that you will probably need to do a medial column uh, uh, plantar flexion uh, maneuvers, like Anish said, like doing a cotton oil. Or, or doing a telonavicular plus uh, 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 TMT fusion, which adds to the morbidity of the whole equation. You cannot correct, in my opinion, you cannot correct a valgus deformity at the subtalar joint by cranking it out. You don't dislocate your, uh, your subtalar joint every time you varicize. That's not normal uh, uh, biomechanics. You, you, you varicize your subtalar joint by internally rotating the oscalsis against the talus. And that's what you should be aiming to do if you're trying to correct it. And with this degree of uh, almost uh, uh, transarticular deformity, you will never be able to achieve that through the subtalar joint. Excellent. That's, that's, the, yeah, that's the opinion. And Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The subtalar joint doesn't open. So the yeah. concept is on paper makes sense. But if you, have, I've done opening wedges for malunions and loss of bone, but you get stuck. The yeah. middle facet and the anterior facet Locked. will not book open. Yeah. It's the absolute not going to happen. So you'll be struggling and nothing will occur even if you tried. Yeah. So, so my point I actually wanted to highlight was how supple you find in your flat foot or your pest planar valgus. It's not the same in the post-traumatic cases. Yeah, good point, man. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mahesh. Uh, if you can stop sharing, we'll hand it over to Rahul. Rahul is from Jaipur, um, quite young and active uh, foot and ankle surgeon from there. Off to you, Rahul. Yeah. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. So uh, we'll go uh, quickly through this case so that we can support the discussion. So my patient is a 40 years old male, a truck driver by profession, and presented to me four months uh, post in, in his injury, uh, sustained due to fall from stairs. So he had complaints of uh, pain while walking and limp, and uh, again, unable to drive, which was his uh, primary profession. So it was managed conservatively elsewhere. So this is uh, what I saw when he presented to me. So it's definitely a uh, 4-3-C uh, tibial pilon fracture. So I went ahead and uh, did scans for him to get a better orientation and view of his uh, joint of his cartilage so we can see there is a definite impaction of the anterior articular surface and in all the views we can see uh, the impacted cartilage here you can see there is a lot amount of uh, uh, vacant space 3d reconstruction was done and uh, we outlined the exact position of the impacted cartilage so i decided to go ahead uh, open it anteriorly uh, try to visualize the joint so this is exactly uh, the space where the cartilage got impacted and not just impacted, it was also rotated anteriorly. The surface uh, anterior sub, uh, of the cartilage was rotated anteriorly. So what we did was we pushed it down and this was the original fracture line. I was able to get it down and uh, place it and you know uh, reattach it to the fracture. Uh, temporarily stabilized with the K-wire. There was a, a big uh, a vacant area which was filled by our tricortical uh, graft. Uh, from the iliac crest and this was the final x-ray now yes there was a uh, minimal step on the uh, articular surface but there was uh, quite an anterior uh, slope which was not, i was not able to you know correctly uh, get the anterior coverage of the talus but the outcome was uh, still better uh, he got back what he wanted so this is uh, three months post-op and he was able to walk And uh, again, it was not uh, a complete squat, but three months post-op, I was very happy with the amount of squatting he could achieve and uh, even the patient was. So yeah, 
uh, thank you for this and now let's get to the discussion and i'm willing to uh, very open to all the points and suggestions from the expert panels here rahul just put your post op x rays please um kartik yeah. shoot two things uh wonderful job uh the tendency for a lot of people is to say oh let's just confuse the bloody thing bad option for a truck driver bad option for somebody who needs to squat to go to the toilet etc if you can go back one x ray as well please rahul uh if you looked at no 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 just that intraoperative x ray intra yeah next one yes yeah that one there now it is it is difficult for me to sort of judge from here but i just wonder whether you could have brought that you know the the one lesson i've learned is when you do these disimpaction uh, uh and and repositioning it's never too much in fact you overdo what you're doing put a bigger graft because the graft will resorb a little bit it will come back a little bit so i've learned that out of bitter experience uh but if anything what you have done at least will not restrict dorsiflexion so that's a that's a huge plus <laughs> point and that's why is is done so well but i've learned that you always overdo it rather than sort of say well it i've moved it a huge amount maybe i should move it any more uh it's always a good idea to really push that through and i think i think that's a wonderful example of how you can actually salvage something which looks disastrous uh when you when you look at the initial x-rays the second thing that that i want to emphasize is you were lucky because the articular cartilage still looks viable uh and you know you were able to bring it down the the concern is that you go in to do this and you look at the articular cartilage and you say oh my god this is chondrolized and i've been caught out in one occasion with that when i had to go and i had to change my mind because the cartilage was completely destroyed so what i almost always do nowadays is to get an mr i get an mri scan just to assess the the health of the cartilage before i i go into this i mean you've illustrated beautifully on that ct that's very very well illustrative of the the dimensions of the large it's almost a giant die punch fragment basically isn't it uh and i think that's a beautiful demonstration of how you have to sit and study your ct frame by frame to try and work out what your strategy is well done thank you sir okay anish any points i think you did a great job trying to salvage his ankle but to be critical not to be a jerk that post op actually unfortunately i've done a couple of these recently and i didn't want to just came back and i didn't do enough correction like karthik said and it it's going to escape anteriorly i know 3 months out it looks okay but unfortunately this will fail it will fail within a year or two you did a hell of a job to try but i guarantee you this guy's going to get ankle arthritis in a year or two Karthik is very nice. You know the guys from the UK are all proper, and we Americans <laughs> are not. So, you know, you look at this, and you can see it's not. You don't have that normal concavity that's there, which is what you try to do. And Karthik's point is correct. You have to go more. And I've burned myself. Same thing. You think, man, that's too much. I've overdone it. And then an X-ray post, you're like, what the hell is this, man? Like it looked good intra-op, and this is unfortunately he's gonna go out the front again. I mean that's just life. Now whether he cares or not much I don't know because I've seen bad x-rays and good outcomes but I think to be critical which what Pradeep asked us to do you crank the hell out of this thing um and you can see that you know the anterolateral aspect isn't great and you what you say you tell the patient you're going to do the best you can you'll make it some superior alignment some stability and he'll be okay the you know you're going to relegate this guy to two surgeries 100% you're going to do this then fusion later for sure so if he has any other issues you tell him the other option to fuse it straight up we're much more aggressive here in america to fuse straight up because dual surgery means dual exposure higher risk of wound complication etc and they have workers comp here so there's a situation if you can't work and you're a truck driver and you injured at work you don't worry about it they'll pay you for it And so if this guy has some pain, can drive his truck and feed his family, that's a better outcome than a fusion where he has no pain and can't feed his family. Sure. But that's okay. the lesson. Sorry, go on, Anish. Sorry. Ah, no, no, the lesson is you tried, but everyone should know that ideally you got to crank that down more and this will unfortunately fail radiographically. Clinically, if he can suffer a little bit and live, then that's fine. Fine. Okay yeah. so one question one question from uh, the delegates at this point of time can 
the situation be salvaged to prevent arthritis? Uh, the, the problem uh, is the question of salvage is not of the articular cartilage, is anterior stability. I think, I think the compromise here is a complete, uh, is a significant loss of anterior stability because the talus has got a void to sublux into anteriorly, and that is where you have the problem. So it is not a question of, you know, can you prevent arthritis? You cannot prevent anterior subluxation here. Uh, the only hope is that he's got enough, uh, uh, enough soft tissue uh, scarring posteriorly to keep him going for a period of time so that he can continue his job. Okay. The other thing that I would say is, if you, this chap had come, you know, say five years later after his original injury, and you could not salvage this uh, this uh, articular fragment to try and bring it down. The subsequent fusion is actually quite a difficult fusion to perform because you've got this giant hole. Uh, you either have to shorten the, the tibia quite substantially uh, or you've got to build it up and hope that, you know, any grafting that you do anteriorly will, will take and, and it will be okay. So I think even from that point of view, attempting to try and reconstruct this is not a bad idea at all. But the lesson learned is do too much rather than too less. And um, so Anish and Karthik, quick, quick question. With especially delayed pylon fractures, if, when you, if you are thinking of reconstructing, would you take a simultaneous consent for fusion? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as I said to you, I've been caught out on a couple of occasions where I opened it, thinking that the cartilage is going to be okay, and it was all, it was all wrecked. And luckily, I think one of them, I had to get retro, retrospective consent. The other, the other chap was actually awake. He had a spinal, and I, I could ask him, halfway through the procedure, but I would absolutely say query fusion on my on my consent form. Okay, Anish? I agree, 100%. And for this case, if you wanted to try to salvage this one more time, Rahul, you can wait six, seven months, make sure your osteotomy is solid as a rock on CT, absolutely. Absolutely. go back in, take it out to an osteotomy, yeah. crank it down, fibular osteotomy as well. You're going to not make this guy normal, okay? And yeah. that may give you that prevention of escape, but again, you're tickling the tiger, so be careful. But it's an option. Yeah, definitely. That, that's why I wanted your, everyone's opinion over here. Now, uh, to be honest, it has been uh, around 18 months since the injury, uh, this surgery has been done. I got a call from this uh, patient about a month back when he was driving all the way from Chennai. So, keeping my fingers crossed if we can continue more uh, for this. Good Great job, man. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Rahul. If you can uh, stop sharing your screen. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Parth, uh, you are next. Parth is a young foot and ankle surgeon from Ahmedabad who is doing quite a name, uh, getting a name for himself there. Parth, off to you. Am I audible right now, sirs? You are. Okay. Is my screen uh, shared? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so right. So this is a 65 year old, a uh, 68 year old female. Uh, she presented to me in the month of November. Uh, she had insertional, uh, chronic insertional uh, tendo uh, TA, uh, TA pain. And she had got a history of uh, steroid injection given to her in about uh, September. And after two months, uh, she had uh, less of a pain for one month. And after about two months, she came to me with severe pain. Uh, I also saw there was calcification of tendo Achilles as well as Haglund's deformity a little bit. Uh, I gave her an option uh, for a surgery where I could uh, just take off the Haglund's deformity and uh, you know might as well spare the tendo Achilles at, at that point. She was reluctant. Uh, she went back. She came after about two months and in January 20, uh, 2019 with her tear of tendo Achilles. Um, Again, the tear was uh, through MRI and uh, the posterior fibers were still there and about 17 mm uh, the dis distance between the distal and the proximal uh, stump was there in the tendo Achilles. Uh, I asked her to get admitted and for an operative procedure. Again, unwilling. Uh, she had a marriage in her family or something like that. And uh, she again uh, was invisible for me. And after 10 weeks, around March end 2019, she came back ready for the procedure just to get admitted. So this is of the January one where you can just see the posterior fibers uh, there of the tendo Achilles and about 1.7 uh, centimeter, 17 mm uh, distance between the two. 
when she came to me, uh, we I didn't go for a repeat MRI or anything. The tests were obvious. Uh, I opened her up. This was about uh, the, the difference between the two, uh, the defect, which was around four to five inches. Uh, I started with taking out the Hagelin's deformity, um, and then uh, of course I uh, identified the FHL, tagged it, and I prepared it by cutting it as distally as possible. Uh, I used a, a bioabsorbable interference screw uh, from Evolutis, uh, the fix-on one. Uh, it was, I think, 7 by 25, which I used. And I fixed the FHL through the calcanium tunnel, uh, making it tight. So then again, uh, I still wanted the tendo Achilles to have a part in her uh, post-op uh, workup. So I, I tried to do a VY plasty uh, where I had a cut and I stretched it out. What different thing I did over here was I used the fiber tape and made three uh, columns. That is the first column would be a medial one, a middle one, and a lateral one. Uh, all the ones uh, looping and, and tagging the tendo Achilles. And then uh, I used the lateral pillar and the lateral part of the middle pillar as one and the middle pillar and the uh, sorry the medial pillar and the middle part of the medial pillar uh, as the second so two different columns uh, i prepared and with the help of a lateral uh, row anchor uh, i i used both the pillars and uh, put it into the calcaneum uh, giving it a, a very big uh, good fixation and the tendo achilles right down buried to the calcaneum um, this is what i could uh, manage and then i of course i uh, completed the vy plasty at last, it was totally done. Uh, it was fixed till the calcaneum with the FHL, and I was very pretty happy with the result. So uh, this is what I had done, and this is the post-operative X-ray. And if uh, I don't know if it would be possible, I'll just show you. I had a three-month-old video of her uh, after three months. That is twelve weeks post-operatively. She had a little bit of limb, but very happy, no pain at all. And uh, of course, because she's 65, the demand of her for work is less. So this is 12 weeks after the surgery. Okay. Do you have the video while while you put up the video? Uh, Anish, what do you think? Well, I think you did a very nice job, man. I mean, that's uh, one of those cases where you know for sure that that distal tendon is not going to be adequate to be your sole reconstruction. I think in a younger person with an insertional rupture, I've just put the Achilles back. But an older patient, FHL transfer works great. The VY was a good idea. I stopped doing the VY because I don't like that one long incision. So I'll jump the bridge. So I'll do a, pro a gastroc recession proxim with that, which we do strayer, leave a skin bridge and just haul on that sucker to get it back down. The technique of your three limbs is brilliant. We luxury have the use of the speed bridge. So yes. I speed bridge pull the Achilles back down. But what you did was a speed bridge in some concept, actually. Yeah. You take the two columns and pull it back down. The only downside is of this, ideally the anchors could be put more posterior because your Achilles is attached to the proximal calcaneus and you ideally want it more posterior to get the right tension. Now, if it heals to that proximal and it functions, I mean, who cares? But ideally you try to get a little bit more and that's why I just do the gastroc proximally. So I don't have to worry about my VY length and tearing it. Just pull that sucker back down. Um, but I will tell you in an older patient, and I'm a heretic on this, the only guy I know that does it. If they're old and they just want to walk and stand and go to the Monday or Masjid, whatever, you can just do F and you're worried about the wound. You can just do FHL. I tension five degrees, maximum plantar flexion and done. Let the Achilles fly. Don't make a big, I make a decision this big, small, not like Kartik. I'm sure I can do it arthroscopically, but not me. I do this. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I never published it. I did it at Michigan a lot. They do fine. They'll never run or jump or nothing, but they'll do fine. And what you don't have to worry about is the wound. If sure. the scuff tissue is great, fine. This is brilliant. But if you're worried about the wound, small FHL transfer is chip shot. You clean out all the, all the bump, FHL, go home. They'll do wonderful. But this is great. Just maybe more posterior. Karthik? Just hold on. Uh, just hold on. Just put your post up x-rays, please. Yeah, that's fine. Karthik, go on. Okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, those two um, 
anchors are the anchors of uh, the uh, the tendon Achilles, and you fix the epitel further back posteriorly with the uh, interference screw. Is no, that right? is fixed anteriorly, more anteriorly. You can see the screw there. It I is over here. I can't see the screw. I can't see the screw actually. It is over here. This, oh, yeah. oh, that is the screw. I do beg your pardon. Okay. Yeah. No, I would agree with Anish that it needs. It, it probably needs to be well posterior. Uh, I am quite pedantic about this. I, you know, there is a 68-year-old, very little activity. 100% of the time, I would just stick an epicel in and do nothing about it. I would not bother with the tendo Achilles at all. Uh, I think the one of the worries that we have here, and you know, I'm, I'm out on a limb, I can't give you any evidence here. If there has been some significant insertional tendinopathy pain, by pulling that uh, um, Achilles tendon and then sticking it into the, into the oscalcis under tension, you might find that a couple of years from now, she comes back and says, well, I've got the old insertional tendinopathy pain back again. Uh, I may be wrong, but as a general philosophy, I think the soft tissue is much too fragile for me in a 68-year-old to consider a big plastic. If there is only if there was only 17 millimeter gap as your original MRI scan uh, showed, just remember it's when you open it and debride it, it's about four times that. So you can't go by that 17 millimeter. What I often do is I get the the uh, a sonographer to maximally dorsiflex the ankle to find out how far up it can retract. And I think that's a more again I haven't published this or anything. That's, that's what I've a, been doing now. Yes. Yeah. So, so. that's a much more accurate method of saying if it's five if it is five centimeters i almost have completely stopped doing vy the exception is two weeks ago i did a uh, a team wales international athlete who because of the lockdown suffered a achilles uh, tendon avulsion and was left uh, to 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 the powers of gods to heal and she came four months later and she had a uh, a, a five and a half centimeter gap and I said I, I can't I can't ignore this and I can't just do an F, uh, uh, FHL that's the only exception 99% of the time I do an isolated uh, isolated uh, uh, FHL uh, transfer but what I do on occasion if it's a younger patient who wants to go back to running etc I piggyback the Achilles tendon onto the onto the fascia of the FHL and that's I think more for proprioceptive uh, functions and to recruit the muscle mass of the gastrocoleus is why I do that. Not because I think it's going to be fantastic uh, from the point of view of uh, biomechanical strength, but I think it certainly plays a role in, in the, the proprioceptive capabilities of the lower limb. And there are some studies which indicate that. that that's my philosophy. And as Anish said, you have a, a, a little incision. You can do this uh, uh, endoscopically. And I think uh, um, Pradeep, you, you've done some of these, uh, the FHL harvest endoscopically. They are very easy to do. Yes, well, yes. I say relatively easy to do. But even if it's open, it's only a tiny incision. Uh, uh, and you should be able to do that quite nicely. But the one thing, I think somebody has actually mentioned that there, and I, and I would agree uh, that you never do, uh, in, in a 68 year old, don't do a VY plasty on its own. It's a disaster. It never works. Because I so don't think they have the, the regenerative potential to get back into some degree. You almost always say, my primary treatment for this is an FHL transfer. And, yeah. the, and, and anything else you do over and above that is just a bonus. But the, the FHL transfer is the primary component. And as Actually, Anish says, uh, if you want maximal honest, sorry, sorry, sorry. biomechanical uh, uh, function out of the FHL, you need to go well posterior. You need to plummet in right far posterior. So can I be a little bit of devil's advocate and start the discussion also sure. is as both Anish and Karthik, you have said, would you even open up and address the at least uh, tear? We know that pre-op he had 17 millimeters. We know the fact that if you would have once you've debrided, it'll be four times. So we know it yeah. will not be uh, feasible to uh, repair it. So can you just do a small incision, take the FHL and just put it on interference and leave the whole TA well alone and just yeah, that's tag exactly it? What, that's exactly what I said I, was, I would do. That's exactly yeah. what I do. Exactly. Just open it, harvest the, the uh, FHL, plumb it in. Don't just ignore the TA because it will save you, you know, four-fifths of your incision that you've got for this VY plasty, etc. It will be completely saved. And from the biological perspective, I think your soft tissue complications will be minimized. 
Yeah, and well, also I think clear. Anish, Anish, I've never been published, okay? I did it and I have given multiple lectures on this. I cannot find the data. So for the younger surgeons, just be careful if you do this. There's, as far as I know, and Karthik, correct me, I've never seen a published series of isolated FHL ignoring the Achilles. I've done the same thing in older patient. Yeah. And it works great. It works great. But be careful because you can't find data to back it up. We're older, you can get away with murder when you're old. Do whatever you want. <laughs> I'm very serious. I make it up now. Karthik can make it up. Pradeep, do whatever you want. But younger surgeon, be careful because if they see somebody else, you do I say FHL, there's nothing, no data to back that up. Yeah. And this is yeah. for older only. Don't take the same concept in a 35-year-old. Very complete nope. different. 35 year old athlete, you or whatever, regular person, anybody here, you debride that tendon, pull that sucker back down. I'm very aggressive on making sure that posterior calcaneus is cleaned out. Yeah. You did a fine job here, but I would have done more that posterior prominence that mm -hmm. has to go completely. Then take the Achilles and stick it back down, either with a speed bridge or this, your novel idea, but those anchors have to go away from posterior to anterior to get that nice coverage and then do a proximal gastroc. If it's so huge a hole that you can't do a, a gastroc VY, turn down is too big incision in my opinion. Do a graft, either hamstring autograft or allograft and span the defect. And the concept of putting the FHL to the Achilles gastroc soleus complex, which is how I trained. If you look at Mafuli's article, Norman Espinosa's data, you get three quarter the strength and more fully published, they get back to their sporting activities. Yeah, when do. you look yeah. at what he defined as sport, gardening and golf. <laughs> I went through his article. I love Nicole. We're friends. I'm like, what the hell does he mean by sport? Gardening and golf. <laughs> okay? So be careful with just expectations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. It's the expectation. Even with a routine... Uh, refixation of the uh, the uh, tender Achilles. I almost always tell all of the patients. I said, you'll be, you probably get eighty percent of strength back, uh, even if it's a perfectly repaired tendon. And anything above that, it's a bonus for you. So always manage expectations in these patients, especially the younger ones. So what I say is, how do you prepare your your uh, tendinopathy? I would like to see is just like Anisha's head, clear shaved. <laughs> <laughs> so it should be. So what I say is, it should be smooth as a smooth as a baby's bottom. There should not be any prominence there. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I make her yeah. feel the tendon is smooth. Lump bump has to go, and calcaneus is totally smooth. No lumps and bumps. Hmm. Yeah, and and I would I would urge you to even. It's not just the, the hagland. You need to go to the posterior surface of the oscalcis and you'll find that little spur there. So you're, you're almost at the plantar yes. end of the oscalcis posteriorly. You need to clean all the way around. I remember Steve Haddad showing this about 20 years ago and I was horrified, thinking, oh my God, he's, he's exposing the whole of the posterior calcaneus. But, but I realized subsequently that is the right thing to do. Yeah, the incision yeah, should go down to the sole, almost to the sole of the foot. Or you can't get to that bump you see on your x-ray. All the way down, I put a Chandler back there yeah. and then blast it off. Yeah. And I think also we have discussed this. I know the fact. See, if you look at this x-ray, you see the interference screw and the two anchors. Aren't they too close to each other? And you're creating almost like a stress riser to cause a fracture if there's a small stumble. What is your opinion? There's just no space there. Yeah. So, you know, there's very little space to put three anchors in there unless you put them from posteriorly, where you've got the longitude and the length of the oscalcis. If you put them from posterior, like you do with the speed bridge, you're putting four screws in, there's plenty of space. But if you put them from superiorly, there's only a tiny triangle where you have to accommodate all of these in, which is why a posterior to anterior fixation is so much better. Get it. So I've never seen it fracture. I always worry, just, no. I mean, if you can, worry, the concern is true, but I've never seen the calcaneus fracture after any of these crazy things we do. <laughs> well, worry, but I, I've never seen it. You're probably no, but, fine. But, but you have you have done more speed bridges, and that's why the speed bridge, see, there is a very specific technique for it and all that stuff. Now, what will happen with people will take a message from here and they'll start using, I don't want to say, but a substandard type of anchors, and you start getting a lot of shitty stuff here as well then. Yeah, I mean, but I'll be honest. I've done a speed bridge with an FHL 
transfer, huge holes. Yeah. I think speed, I'm an Arthrex guy, so I can only say so much. I think the speed bridge concept is great. P to A is perfect because you have a huge spread of the holes. But I've done yeah. that with a huge FHL hole, and they still can do oak. I'm not, I will tell you the concern for calcaneus fracture with just one tunnel and two anchors is nothing to worry about. I think the technical concern is that you needed to get more of that push of calcaneus, sure. put the whole construct more posterior. And that's it, which, you know, I've done this too. I mean, we've all done this. They yeah. do fine. Yeah. Ideally, okay. you want to go back. Fracture is theory. I mean, I agree with you, Pradeep. Fracture is a concern, but this is it. I've done worse. And they do okay. <laughs> I've never heard of it, honestly. Sure. That the calcaneus fracture. So, you know, ideally, yeah, but I wouldn't stress about it too much. Sure. But the other thing is having a lot of foreign, and we have discussed this, and I, we've, with, with Karthik and you have discussed this a lot as well. The lot of foreign body material, and especially the ethy bond and the fiber wire in that small area. And especially if you have a lot of knots which are there, those co can be a lot of irritation as well. Yes, that, I think the knots, the main benefit of the speed bridge is a huge and broad fixation. But no, no knot. That skin's terrible. The knot, no knot is the biggest advantage of that technique. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I am um, one question from the chat from the participants. Um, what do you think about uh, uh, Peronis Bravis as a transfer? So Nicolo is in the audience somewhere. Yeah, they, in the chat session. Somebody asked, um, "Can Peronis Bravis be used instead of FHL?" That's what what's your FHL is. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Mafuli says that is better than FHL and athlete. Karthik, you probably know more. I looked at Mafuli. I was like, "Are you mad?" But he swears by it. Is published on it. I've only done it once when the F in a crazy case where the guy had no calcaneus, weird operation. <clears throat> I fully still don't understand how that's a good idea, but he swears by it. Yeah. I don't know, Karthik. You ever done it for a normal person? No, I've done for when the FHL fails. Um... Uh, that was the early occasion where I did it. My problem with the perineal, I, I've I, actually many years ago, I've done a combined, I've done plumbed both uh, FHL and the perineus brevis in, and that was for a calcaneovalgus deformity following a spinal gunshot wound. So it was a spastic calcaneovalgus deformity, and we needed a huge amount of pull. So I released the, the tibant. I pulled the, move the tip band posteriorly. That didn't work. So I did a combined FHL to try and pull the foot back down. My only, you know, biomechanical question is, at least we know the FHL is almost directly in the line of pull that the TA used to. I struggle with how you move a, a tendon, which has got its axis of pull almost posterior laterally, and then expect it to pull the, the, uh, the, the heel up in a concentric fashion. So I agree with you. I can't get my head around what uh, Nikolai uh, says. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that it probably has got a, a, a better strength compared to the FHL. I think that's probably the only explanation as to why they seem to do better. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Parth, for a fantastic, a great Perfect. case discussion. Thank you, Thank you. I would like, if you can unshare your screen, and I would like Inderji to take over for the next case. I'm sure uh, Karthik, Inderjit, everybody knows uh, Karthik and Anish. Inderjit has been there in IFAS, has been a IFAS member for such a long time. A uh, fantastic guy who has his own now practice near near Delhi, called place called Palwal. Inderjit, off to you. So this is a case of a talus fracture, which is an 11 months old fracture. He came with pain in the ankle and had difficulty in walking. These were his x-rays which were brought by him. So, uh, these are the other views I got. And look at this. Uh, there's a proper talus fracture with a talonavicular dislocation there. I got a few MRI done. So you can see the whole uh, talus in the T2 look so bad. The navicular is dislocated. There's a body fracture. This is an 11 months old. So this was an intra-op image where I recreated the fracture. I did a fibular osteotomy. I recreated the fracture. Did this. I don't have all the intra-op images, but did this. Did a subtalar fusion with the talonavicular fusion. 
even after once i finished doing it the ankle was subluxating so i had to do this childers procedure and put off a steenman pin through the calcaneum up to the top these were his immediate post ops so uh, pradeep sir over to you as i don't have follow ups this patient was lost to follow up he never turned back after the procedure that's fine not a problem great case if you go just go back to the first x ray when he presented with so he came with this to me yeah that's fine anish what would you do if this was not acute in this case no this is 11 months old yeah yeah as i say so if you want at the same same timeline yeah you have no choice to if you try to fix this and get crazy with your mri you're going to fail i think i wouldn't try to salvage his hind foot at all i would have done what you did you can see he's got comminution immediately and so i would have done the same sub taylor and uh tn fusion through the uh, the ankle was okay so i didn't feel like touching the ankle at all yeah i i i i think what you did was perfect the only thing i don't understand is the the ankle instability post op that part i i can't wrap my head around based on the x ray so i'm curious what was unstable was it varus instability or valgus instability cuz that part i don't understand I don't more like understand. a varus varus instability, and I kept thinking the ankle was giving way, you know. So as yeah, soon I as would have been, I would have done a soft tissue laterally, maybe through your eyes, maybe it's because of the osteotomy and the exposure, or just to hell with it. People get stiff as a board. I'm not a big fan of shooting a pin up in this case. I People guarantee you, not, but I didn't have a choice. I mean, I I tried to fix up the soft tissues, and you know, I put the pin last in the end after I fixed the fibular osteotomy, fixed the soft tissues. even then i could feel the ankle subluxating hmm. i mean it is what it is i think you did a great job i don't think there's any other way to fix this besides an arthrodesis and it's it's not going to be in varus because it's a body fracture if there's any varus really you should do a true triple but in this case that doesn't count it's a body not a neck but if it was a neglected neck fracture in varus you have to do a triple to shorten that lateral column to swing it around but in this case it's a unique body fracture so So sub Taylor TN is absolutely fine, but I'm much more aggressive about taking the sub Taylor joint now, especially in these screwed up cases. There's no real loss. This whole medial triple concept, I was a big fan of, and I quit on it because I think you're we're really screwing ourselves on deformity. But in this case, you did great. I mean, unfortunately, he's walking around with a pin shot through his foot somewhere in India. But barring that, he's doing he did a great job, man. Karthik. <laughs> yeah. Can I just ask you to move uh, one picture further? I just want to see that uh, instability. I just I I wonder whether it's valgus instability. I may be wrong, but just can I just have a look at that again? Keep keep going in the intraoperative picture where you showed us the the unstable ankle fracture, yeah. No, not here. Keep going the the x-rays where you said you had to Yeah. Yeah. So this is a there's a lateral shift of the of the talus, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. so it's probably a valgus instability now if you go back to the original x-ray the 11 month old x-ray i am almost certain that there is a uh, there is a deltoid deficit because he's got a completely mushed medial process so i think where hey, that's it yeah so i think it's quite likely that he's got a lax medial deltoid which may well be the the, the cause of the problem but i mean of course you've uh, you've fused so can i ask did you, why did you plan to use a lateral approach you know you uh, could do that you could do that double fusion I, quite I, happily I through a medial I approach could you medially too i had to clean up medially too yeah. i did open up medially but okay. then i i wanted uh, the i had to i wanted to see the body perfectly right so i wanted to do a, a lateral uh, fibular osteotomy and go through it i okay. i had another incision medially to clear up the gutter there to right okay because the talonavicular was not sitting in place sure but I'm but this but what, what i was trying to get across is that i would have probably done the whole thing through a medial incision not bothered with the lateral side at all because the lateral side is the only side that wasn't actually injured in the process so i would have left the lateral side completely because all you're looking to access is the body which you may have to do a medial malleolar osteotomy uh, but usually if you plant to flex it enough you should be able to graft it uh, and then um, wax some screws from behind like you've done you've done a fast, superb job there uh so did you graft the the fracture and the talonavicular joint i used whatever bone i removed 
you know. Okay. So All right. Okay. Said, I use that. I didn't take another graft, or you know, I didn't. Okay. Well, I mean, but that's a beautiful job, and I would agree with uh, with Anish that if anything, I would have probably used an external fixator because, again, you know, I don't know how much damage uh, just putting a, a pin a KY into the Arctic surface is concerned, but putting a Steinman pin, I think both from the point of view of the thermal trauma that it's likely to cause as you whack it across a, you know, a sclerotic joint, a subarticular bone, but also the fact that you've now created an osteochondral defect in, the, uh, in both the talus and the tibia, I, I, I probably wouldn't have done that, but otherwise, man, you've done a great job. The most important thing is you've, you've recreated the, the axis of the medial ray and you've recreated the calcaneal pitch. I think those two are pivotal in getting a good outcome from this. So you've, you've recreated the uh, anatomic dimension. So the likelihood is that barring the subtilar function, which he obviously has lost, you, he's likely to get a great result from this. But I would still watch that medial deltoid. <laughs> the only other thing you can add for fixation, I mean, it's perfect, but because you're worried about getting more screws across the tail, let's just do what uh, was described out of Duke a navicular to calcaneal screw in addition, yeah. and that will help control your angular stress to the subtalar joint without compromising more. I mean, I bet you this will do great, but just as a, something for everyone to remember, that navicular calcaneal screw is great for a triple arthrodesis mm. fixation rigidity. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant idea. I've done it. It's great. And it minimizes the need to get more TN screws when you already got a compromised talus. So a question from one of the participants. If you, uh, especially like 11 months, you open up on the medial side, you do a delta, or you do your medial malleolar osteotomy, and also you find that the deltoids is incompetent. How will you manage it? Karte? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd go back to the previous case, you know, where you had that SCR4 injury. You had yep. that, uh, and I would do almost exactly the same. Um, now the question is, do I do it at the same time? Or do I do that as a delayed uh, phenomenon? It's, I think, subject to individual opinion. But if you're going to open the medial side, you can do all of the above procedures through the medial side, in my opinion. Uh, you can also make adjustments. I mean, if you find that the, the, the deltoid is completely ruptured, you have to do something. Uh, you can't, you know, either put a, an X-fix or a transarticular pin and ex expect it all to gum up on the inside after 11 months. That won't happen. Uh, so I would probably just use a, an, a, an internal brace or an internal brace-like device or, or a FDL tendon because everything is available in the vicinity. You can just take a, a, a strip and do a, a, a tunneling procedure. Obviously, you've got to look at the permutation. So if you've done a medial malleolar osteotomy, a tunneling technique, it becomes a bloody pain. I think, oh, hang on a minute. And maybe Interjeet was right in going laterally uh, so that you can, you can tunnel. Because if you do a medial malleolar osteotomy, tunneling will become a huge problem. Exactly. Uh, and also, so, if you're, also, if you're using an internal brace, yeah, then you would you've have already that. got two or three screws. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. So it's just, a, it's just a question of sort of balancing the, the odds. And I think that's why, again, I, I go back, you, know, you, had, you had a CT done uh, and an MRI done, which is very useful. I couldn't make out the, the features of, uh, of the soft tissue in the MR scan. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you, you've, you've got that, Interjeet. But, uh, I, I, I got that. The... Soft tissue, the deltoid didn't look as bad, didn't look torn on the MRI. I don't okay. have the other images. No, like I, think, I think it's, it's because of the, the crushing, evulsing effect on the medial process is why the deltoid uh, was lax, in my opinion, anyway. If you looked at the... the, the you know, the, sorry? The, impingement, the impingement of the talus when it was fractured but, over the deltoid. Correct. Yeah, I think that's probably what happened. It simply mushed the medial yeah. uh, talar attachment. The tibio talar component probably came off. I mean, uh, speculation again. Uh, but when you, when you uh, screened it after you've done the, the triple, you found that there was a lateral shift. That's what I can see on that picture, isn't yeah. it? That the, the tail is shifting laterally. And the presumption yeah. is, yeah. So even here, you can actually see there's an increased clear space medially. And there is slight incongruence where the, the tail is tilted a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and as, as Ani said, maybe it was just an intra-articular have an intraoperative phenomenon where you've done the fibular osteotomy, everything is wobbling and loose around. But presumably you rechecked it after you fixed the fibula, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Excellent. That's, that's a great case. I fixed it, then it was lax, so I had to pass it in. You know, I didn't have any other choice to yeah, make it sure, no. 
that's a perfectly reasonable, good job. How has he done? You know, do, can you tell us about the post op? I have no idea. He was lost. Yeah, man, he had no oh. Okay. So that's what yeah. Anik said. He's roaming around somewhere with a pin up his ankle. And <laughs> <laughs> Doing wonderful. Now it's in his chest wall, but that's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> Indrajit will let you know if he if he reaches in Mumbai. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> in India, all of you all are here. <laughs> I know. I know. Great guys. Fantastic. Uh, next, I would like to invite Abhijit. Abhijit has got uh, managed to get some internet, um, and he's ready to uh, go. Abhijit. Hello. Has he joined us? Yes, he I, he just called me up saying he has got internet, so uh, he I would think be. He hasn't joined yet. Let's go on with K Rao till he joins. I think he has something called his Acer. So if you just search Acer, he is there. He is there. Ha, huh, here. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sir, yeah. Indeed, we can hear you. Yeah. And Anish sir, good morning. And Kartik sir, good uh, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Man, hope you're okay. Yeah, I am okay. I am you, okay. You safe? Safe from the uh, ravages of nature? It's coming Hello? every way, man. You know. Yeah, that is that. Mini nature yeah. with the cyclone, mini nature with the goddamn virus. Well, how are we safe, man? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Abhijit, uh, you can start cool. sharing. Abhijit, you can start okay. sharing, please. Yeah. Okay. 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 Post uh, disabled to participant screen sharing. Uh, can you? Help me. One has to make him the co-host. Olympic guys. Jesh. Jesh. Hello. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Yeah. You just shared the assets screen. Uh, one minute, yes. Yes, sir. You can share now. Yes, sir. Yes, Pradeep, sir. I'm able to hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesh, uh, Abhijit needs to be made a host for sharing of his yeah, screen. Yeah, I've already made uh, Abhijit okay. sir as a host. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I am now sharing my screen. Uh, can you help me, Jesh? Uh, how I... if, you sir, just if, go... if, if you move so your, 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 your... Abhijit, sir, your screen is not shared. Yeah. At the bottom, there is something called as a share screen. So if you move your cursor, uh, that slide, uh, the screen sh share screen in green will come up. Can you can you visible my screen? Hello. Oh, we can't. We can't. No, boy. Uh, you have to go down to the bottom of your screen and click share screen. Otherwise, we'll not see it. Abhijit, yeah. If you just move your cursor, move your mouse, move your mouse on the screen. Hello. Right down to the bottom. I think he's stuck. I think we'll move on to the next one, and we'll try to sort out. Indrajit, can you just sort out Abhijit, please? Okay. Um, I'll call upon the next uh, Kamlakar. Yes, sir. Yeah, if you can start uh, your case presentation, and we'll come back to Abhijit later on. Yeah, no problem. I'm audible, sir. Yes, you are. Yeah, uh, I think my screen is okay. Yes. Yeah, today I will be presenting a case of uh, talar fracture. Uh, thank you, Indrajit, for uh, doing most of my job. I'll be just rushing through. <laughs> so it's a 21 years old female presented with a complaint of pain and difficulty in bearing weight on the right lower limb. You had a history. She had a history of injury six point five months back due to fall from a height and was diagnosed as having talar neck fracture and was managed with close reduction and internal fixation with a four mm cantilever cancellous screw. The day of injury and index surgery was back to January 2017 
and she had a calcaneal fracture on the left side which was managed conservatively on examination we found there was an antalgic gait there was a swelling present cavovarus deformity was there which was mild and there was a restriction of ankyl rom and septalar rom was painful and also mildly restricted yeah uh, this is the x ray what we got the lateral view and this is an attempted uh, talar view at that time but possibly we were not successful so this is the opposite side x ray where uh, there is a calcaneal fracture healed up so now uh, the thing was we went in and did a ct for that a small video of the ct this an axial there was a comminution on the medial side with a screw running over there and it was not truly body it was at the junction of the body and this having a slight obliquity over there then the quarries were what to do it is 6 months should we wait and watch or do go for a reconstruction or plan for a fusion she was 25 21 years old female unmarried so there was a lot of concerns from the family so we just counseled them regarding the multiple procedures risk of avn and alternative plan is to go for a fusion and we went with the option of going for a reconstruction with the back of mind an option of fusion also if you are not able to do that on table the counseling was done regarding the ttc the talo calcaneal pantalar fusion or triple or reconstruction all the everything almost everything was done because she was a 21 years female in an indian scenario that emotional background was playing a lot and we went through a medial and lateral approach wantedly the lateral approach was taken a bit low down to see for the including the sinus tarsi one so that we can see for the septalar joint did a medial malus osteotomy implant removal debridement or if with bone grafting the uh, problem what we faced intraoperatively was it was a purely osteoporotic bone because of non weight bearing and controlling the heel varus was a bit problem for us and we were in a two minds because it is around 2017 almost 3 years back my expertise was also not that great at the time so i was in two minds regarding the soft tissue release and having any vascular damage and all those things so i didn't go more aggressively but i could get this this was the immediate post op with a reconstruction and a bone graft and a medial malus osteotomy done and following this this is the same immediate post op took in a different way 3 months follow up 6 months follow up and this is 12 months follow up and this is 24 months and this is taken in 2019 jan so already we, i think 2017 to 2019 we crossed so possibly she has not repaired but when i spoke to her on phone i could get a video this is a uh, heel positioning and this is a tried uh, uh, broadens view and this is her walking video you can see without any chappal on the hand or shoe on there she was walking very comfortably but without a chappal she is having a problem in having a knee extension to a bit and the heel is still in slight varus but she is okay managing with that she was happy at least she had a bit of ankle movement but surprisingly her ankle rom is also not that happy because she is not crossing the neutral she is getting almost to neutral but not crossing the neutral so we when we checked that uh, in the cm this was what we found plantar flexion neutral and dorsiflexion there was some sort of a bony block so now my queries are have we crossed the risk of avn till what is the reason for the restricted dorsiflexion is it the bony block or the soft tissue problem and any virus at the septalar joint is still left and she is not complaining of any pain in the septalar joint rightly and would uh, septalar fusion would have been a better option associated with that or any soft tissue releases would have been helped like doing a gastric release or a posterior uh, um, tip post release or something like that i rest it fantastic kartik okay uh this is a great case man this is a great case this is a totally different animal from the previous one the previous one was a body fracture and as uh as anish uh, alluded to body fractures don't go into the varus 
uh, supination position, whereas classically the neck fracture, even if there is a, a little bit of an extension into the body, the neck fractures are the ones. And you've had the perfect neck fracture, the perfect storm, because you've got a neck fracture which will immediately supinate or externally uh, rotate the, the tailor head relative to the body. The second thing is you've got severe comminution, so it will collapse into various in addition. So you've got both the components that sets the stage for a severe cable varus deformity. And that's what this lady originally came in with. You can see that the, the body portion of the fracture has also gone up. So there's a big articular step uh, in the anterior most part. I don't know whether that's intra-articular or not. I couldn't work that out in the CT scans uh, because you'll have to see it a little, a little slower in order to work that out. So you've got the classic midfoot. This is what I call a midfoot driven hind foot varus deformity okay so because of the supination at the midfoot there's lateral load bearing so instinctively the subtalar joint goes into into varus now there's some great work done by by stefan ramelt and hans zwip and they some done some amazing work in in taylor malunion and the the mantra you keep repeating every single case is that varus is the death of the foot you need to un derotate that uh, supination deformity. But you also, in your case, because of the severe medial um, uh, uh, comminution, you need to lengthen the medial length of that tailor neck, uh, so to speak. So the first consideration should be, you're going to osteotomize. Again, it was difficult to work with. This is a malunion, I presume. There was no, there was no non-union component in this. Is that right? Uh, this was a malunion, and you had to do an osteotomy. Is that correct, no, Mr. This Dr. was a non-union, non-union. This, this was a non-union, so it makes it, it a little not easier. Completely united. Not completely, but you, 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 you could unpick the fracture, right? So the first yeah, thing right. is the first thing is to stabilize uh, the hind foot, and you have to constantly look to see whether the hind foot is neutral, and rotate that tail, our neck, uh, 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 and head back into position. The second thing is you need to graft the medial side uh, of, the, of the talus so that you valgusize that talar uh, head and neck orientation. Thirdly, this is the one situation where I wouldn't use posterior screws. I, I really wouldn't use that uh, in this setting. I would probably use a molded plate, possibly medially, even if it meant that it was catching the, the medial malleolus because you can go in and take that out in a few months' time. Uh, or you could use a lateral plate contoured in such a fashion that it pulls that uh, the, the, the tail, our head and neck into an extended position. But it's the graft. You, you have to graft the medial side in this equation. Uh, if, because if you didn't do that, uh, so if you put the two screws in, it'll automatically compress it. And that is probably why you've still got some residual various deformity is because that uh, medial shortening and supination is not fully corrected yet. It is a very difficult case. I understand that. Uh, and I think given the circumstance, that's the reason. You asked about soft tissue release. I think I'm not entirely convinced that apart from possibly a proximal gastroc release, I, I probably wouldn't do too much because the more soft tissue release you do, the greater the potential risk of vascularity to, to the tailor body. So I, I would be a little careful about. Thirdly, I'm not entirely sure as to whether you needed that medial and uh, lateral incision. Again, I would have probably done most of it if not all of it, through the medial side. But, you know, you may have had your reasons because you wanted to look into the subtalar joint, but you can look into the subtalar joint beautifully through a medial incision. The only areas of soft tissue release that I may have considered is probably going into the anterior and the mid middle subtalar joint where you may have had to do a little bit of release, but otherwise I wouldn't have... Uh, I, I try and avoid any significant local soft tissue release in tailor fractures as a general philosophy. I think you did a good job, 100%. Hell of a case. And I, saving yeah. her hind foot motion was not unreasonable. The subtalar joint is shot, which you know. I mean, you look at your pre-op CT and your post-op x-ray, subtalar joint is gone from with yeah. regards to the arthritis. It's it's arthritic. Part of the reason why I think you have everything Karthik said is 100% is correct. I'm a larger fan of a dual approach. I think you can see better dual approach and soft tissue dissection with that lateral is irrelevant because you're not hitting anything lateral that's going to prevent blood flow. So that's for me. But again, if you can do it through one medial incision, great. I actually don't think you need an osteotomy. You could probably get away with not doing it because it's more yeah. distal. But I didn't look at the CT as detailed as you. 
and I try not to do osteotomy as much as possible. I hate that part of the operation. Yes. <laughs> Especially for this case. You do need to do a wedge allograft immediately to pull that, push that foot back as Karthik said, that's critical. Now, if you don't have that available to you, if you don't have iliac crest allograft, you're not comfortable doing that, or you can't do it that day of surgery, then what you need to do is shorten laterally and do a, sub, and do a triple arthrodesis. Because you cannot lever in varus and expect the hind, no matter what fusion you do with subtalar, you're still going to be left in varus. So if you don't have the ability or realize to do that medial column lengthening to really push that whole thing back to neutral, then do a triple arthrodesis and shorten the lateral column and rotate the subtalar joint in place. And honestly, I would tell you, if you look at the outcome, she probably functionally, even though the x-ray shows you have a hind foot that's not fused, I would guarantee you that functionally she had the same function with a triple than she would with what you have because the subtalar yeah. joint's already so stiff in right. her case. As a surgeon, we, we, she's young, she's got, not getting married yet, and so it's, it's your heart wants to save the joint, but functionally, I would just say probably fine. The only benefit of not fusing at the same time is there's slightly less soft tissue dissection. And so maybe the, there's a less chance of non-union AVM. So I think opening wedge medially, plate, plating like Karthik said, laterally, medial plate I've done as well, but that does have to come out for sure, yeah. is the best thing to do. And the other release is maybe a telonavicular release. If you felt it was adducted a little bit, I would not have touched the posterior tip tendon. Um, no. And, and the middle facet, anterior facet release maybe, but if it's so stuck in the subtalar joint, it doesn't move after all of that, you should be fusing it at that point. Yeah. That's what God's telling you to do. Okay. But, I mean, it uh, looks good if she's functional. I mean, honestly, her so, tail is so, dead. That's good, man. Yeah. Uh, just a few things. Um, I was just reading Stefan's and uh, Swift's article, which had a lot of presentation coming up. On the medial side, what they say is use a Hinterman's distractor. Okay. And that is the key thing which Stefan has done is all his papers on Taylor Mal unions yeah. and non unions. Where you, you, where you start looking on the end on, and you see that supination, you put your hinterman, you distract Correct, it yeah. till, you, till you see this whole correction, how you would do the cotton osteotomy. That is the way you look at it. And where you get the correction, you put your trapezoidal graft onto your medial side. Okay. So, and I think that would have probably, as, you, as Karthik has already said, a midfoot driven hind foot virus yeah. probably is a cause. My question, one question before we move on to the next one. Why do you think the talus is so flat and why there is a restriction in the dorsiflexion at the ankle joint? Uh, I Probably think... a little flexed at the neck. Correct. Just good to say that there's still residual deformity in plantar flexion at the neck. I think that's the reason why, even if your, your perception is that the talus is excursioned all the way, the foot doesn't come up that far because the talus, with the midfoot and the forefoot attached to it, it's all still plantar flexed. Okay. So there is a medial. Uh, so effectively, when you are in malunion or nonunion, you have your medial side shortening and there is a plantar flexion as well. So which needs to be corrected. So the question to you, Dr. Rao is, have you got the balls to go back in and correct that again? <laughs> I think he's, he's earned his balls. He's uh, done absolutely. it quite well for three years. Do you know, as yeah. Annie says, if I were the patient, I think compared to what she was before your operation, she's incredibly, she's done incredibly well. And I seriously would tell her, look, don't push your luck. You cut your losses, cope with what you've got and get on with it. Okay. Uh, Rao, uh, Kamlakar, can you just post the post-op uh, last x-ray, please? The last follow-up x-ray, if you don't mind. It's a great case for discussion. And, uh, yes. and I think also I would advise everybody, all the participants and I think all faculties, Stefan, Stefan Remald and Zweb has done fantastic yeah, amazing um, work. work on this. And I think one of the largest series is, is from them. And he takes individual cases and makes a case out of it. I think that's brilliant. So again, as you rightly said, uh, you would not put that posterior screw. You would go through the yeah. head of the tailors into the... No, uh, no, 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 no. I, I would use a plate. Ah, uh, okay. As, uh, you know, if, yes, uh, as, uh, as Anish says, if you use a medial plate, that's probably ideal, but then you have to take it out. So you can use a, a lateral, there are special, there are tailor plates available with many yes. foot and ankle kits now. And you can, you can use one of those to try and hold that 
Valgazized uh, position, and that would also prevent that uh, uh, the uh, the plantar flexion uh, deformity. In addition, so it'll hold all the bits in place until it heals up. Correct. And if you see these I X-rays, it's partially it's... threaded screw. If you're going to use screws for tailless fractures, I never use partially threaded no, screws. That's fully correct. threaded screws. Well, you wanted to because you're trying to fix it, but in this case, it will come. It will allow you to piston and go in a very so always use a fully threaded screw because you never want that even three millimeter collapse into varus is a mess yeah so you jack it open like uh pradeepa said like ramal and everybody karthik said and then fully threaded screws and acutely you may need a graft acutely sometimes so this yes. is a chronic yeah. thing but if you do this acutely and that whole medial side is trashed do not worry about putting some graft immediately and strutting it with the fully threaded screws. If you don't have access to iliac crest on that day, fine. Strut it, take some calcaneal autograft and fill the hole, but use medial fully threaded screws and always fix laterally first. And that will at least keep you from falling into varus. Great. Yeah. And just two things I want to point out. If you see this x-ray, the lateral x-ray, you see how the you can see the varus. You see the subtalar joint opening up. It clearly shows that there is a varus. And it's easy because, you know, Karthik and I are not showing our dirty laundry. So you did a phenomenal <laughs> job, man. No, it's just to people to show people yeah, how yeah, to read the x-rays. No, no, no. I just kind of feel this... bad because we're just here mouthing off, but we have nothing to show, you know. It's a healthy case. But it is, it is by far the commonest sequel to a varus. Taylor's fracture. Taylor's fracture. The varus is the commonest uh, sequel. Yeah. Very, and very often, especially the big mushy it. splash, you know. Make sure you and, do a triple. I had yeah. a lady <laughs> last year, she had a neglect, missed Taylor neck fracture dislocation, came to me at two months. I arrogantly did a tail navicular sub Taylor fusion. I thought I was genius. Came back after a year, says, what, my, my side eye foot's killing me. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I took her back. I revised the osteotomy. I did a collateral closing wedge calc osteotomy, Taylor osteotomy, CC. We're going to do the whole thing over again. <laughs> Poor lady, it's my fault for being stupid. You have to do triple. Medial triple is only for flexible flat foot. Swear to God, nothing else is basically useful for it except a straight up Taylor navicular arthritis without any deformity. But be careful, especially in this case, because I didn't shorten the lateral column. It was my mistake. I should have. And she ended up being stuck. It was stupid on my part. We all do it. Correct. We all, we all learn from our mistakes, Anish. Yeah. But the key is to learn. He is to learn. Okay, learn. Thank you so much, Kamlakar. Um, I think Abhijit is Thank online. You. Abhijit, you're ready to share the screen? Abhijit? Yeah. Yeah, we are ready to. You can share your screen, please. Can you, can you? Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, God. Abhijit, sir, press F5. F5? Yeah, F5, yes. It will start the slideshow. Abhijit? Yeah. Yeah. So just go on slide number one first. Yeah. yeah. And now go on slide show. Slide yeah. show. Yes. Thank you. Great. Next. So my case is a neglected midfoot injury. Uh, this is a male of 70 years. Uh, he had an injury two years back. Initially treated by some local physician, but the uh, deformity is not corrected. And patient uh, since then uh, walk with the head of the talus. So patient came to us with a pressure show during the walking. He had a pain and patient was non-diabetic but hypertensive. 
so here is the x ray which present to us after the initial injury of 2 years here the talonavicular clean cut dislocation and here is the Just go the, the next one. Walking like this. Yes. Yeah, just go because a video. So it is post injury yeah. two years. Uh, show the X-ray. So we did a CT scan and we saw extra show. Yeah, and uh, we plan for do a uh, TTC. So this is the position. We just go through the lateral incision. We osteotomize the uh, fibula lower end. Hello, and we. Yes. do the uh, ttc nail through and through and we put the fibula osteomized fibula as a vascular graft and here is the post op uh, picture so we did this because the patient was 70 years old and during operation par operatively we reduce the talonavicular joint and there is uh, some charcot like joint we found during the operation so we fixed with ttc nail and put the fibula cut fibula with another two uh, cancellous screw so here is after the operation patient used the a for brace and here is the thing after 2 years patient came to us with union and the nail is broken because when we asked the patient that he told us he supposed to walk without the brace so that is the cause of this uh, implant failure so my uh, observation patient is for patient counseling is very important and always stand for post operative protection like afa for the life club okay so this is the case abhijit can you just put the yeah. pre op x ray please sure adish what do you think let me look at that pre op again one more time yes give me one second I mean, I. Yeah. Yeah. So it's amazing that the tail and avicular joint was reducible. I am floored. Now it makes some sense, right? When you lock the position of the talus and the ankle mortis, it takes it out of that medial plantar medial subluxation, and you're derotating it through the fusion. And so you can get away with that. And if you have a TTC, the tail and avicular joint really cannot go anywhere. and it bypasses the concern for doing a triple and have the whole ankle go into valgus so it's actually from that standpoint a brilliant idea i've never done that i have to be honest with you i think it it looks really good the the you are sacrifice the is ankle or is arthritic too or no you have the yeah. ankle yeah now? yeah 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 let's do the operation the ankle is yeah so primarily we plan for that because the uh, neuro uh, vascular system is patient is not so much uh do patient is non diabetic but we think that 2 years old uh this kind of injury patient is also 70 years so why we take the chance we will go for the no, it makes sense i think if you try to do a straight triple and spare the ankle joint a guarantee is ankle will go into valgus 100% and you'll be miserable um and for this age you made i think you made a very good decision to do a ttc fusion i've i give you credit for not doing a pan taylor i think that's great the implant failure i mean you prepared the subtalar joint properly that's one lesson that we all learned that if you don't prepare the subtalar joint and you just do a straight nail and bypass that's not ideal always prepare the subtalar joint properly yeah yes so you can get as much as possible and i don't put the fibula back And the reason why I don't, I know Karthik is opposite, so he can yell at me. 
<laughs> is because I think there is some compression that will occur through these nails. And having external fixation laterally that goes to the talus and the tibia, in this case, it healed, so irrelevant discussion, but sometimes that will strut that ankle joint out so it can't compress. If I'm going to stick it back, I'd leave the distal aspect alone just as a buttress. But I think if you try to strut laterally and use a nail, a nail will compress a little bit for sure. And so you may get into trouble with having that strut holding the length out while the main part is trying to compress through a nail. If you use a plate, it's different. 100% different for the plate because there's no actual compression. But with the nail and doing a fibula mm -hmm. strut, I don't know, but I don't. I never do it. And I think it looks very good, man, for what he has. It's a brilliant idea. That Did you pop the talus in place? Did you do anything to put it in place? No. Uh. So how did the talonavicular joint reduce? Yeah, when we, we when the patient is under anesthesia and we, we, we just plan for do the TTC, that time we, uh, we easily reduce the joint. So there is no problem at all during and, that part. So that's why. Okay. And did you put just KYs yeah. also post off of? Yeah, few... during holding. Yeah, just, just no, 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 no. Okay. No. Ka no. Karthik. Okay, uh, I'm I'm a bit confused um, about the whole sequence uh, of events now. Aren't so we this... all? Aren't we all? <laughs> um, <laughs> so this was a midfoot fracture dislocation. Is that correct? The, the, I mean, yes. the x-rays are not very clear. Yes. So this was a midfoot dislocation. Um, and it, at the time, uh, you know, when you made the decision to operate, why did you decide to do a fibular osteotomy and go into the ankle? Um, was that because this is a, uh, the plan was to do a, a TTC fusion right from the start? Because, I mean, it just seems kind of incongruous for me that you're doing a TTC fusion for a midfoot dislocation. Uh, I, I can't mean, get, I can't get my head around that. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. As a, yeah, yeah. The Dog patient is right? a lot. No, I, we we plan for three four uh, reason. We uh, we plan this TTC for three four reason. One, uh, there is uh, like a charcoal like joint. We 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 saw the clinically patient. There is a loss of sense. Two years. There is a sore, and we primarily not plan to not touch the sore. And again. The patient is 70 years old. And if we only do the talonavicular reduction and in future there may be uh, the thing is uh, go in uh, arthritis or like that. So as because there is a loss of sensation uh, around the uh, foot and ankle and patient is also anxious whether he is able to walk with his uh, good uh, foot and it is also already two plus years old injury. So all together, we plan for to make a TTC nerve. But you, but uh, you know, the, the midfoot uh, component of it, <clears throat> how did you stabilize yeah. that? You know, so the, yeah, the big, it, it, big that, instability that, that, is in the midfoot, isn't it? So the talonavicular joint is unstable. Yeah, when, the when cuboid we, joint presumably is unstable and the subtalar joint is probably unstable. Once you've yes. reduced all of these bits in together, how did you, did you put a frame or did you put some wires in to hold the bits? No, no nothing. We, we just post-operatively, we keep the patient 10 weeks in uh, Plaster. POP casing. Yeah, right. 10 weeks. Abhijit, sorry, I'll just yeah. interrupt in that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. What, yeah. what Karthik is saying is, if this is a midfoot injury and we were thinking yeah. even of a Shako, this yeah. would be a midfoot shako, okay? Yeah. Which is the most common shako which you would normally find. And people, and I think Anish, Karthik, and a lot of people would think of doing a midfoot fusion, okay? Yeah. If it is a shako. Yeah. And I'm not trying to be rude or trying to be very aggressive, but I'm trying to be a little bit blunt, which Karthik cannot be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And, Tell me. and, and, no, and normally, yeah. and normally, Anish, and that's what Anish was trying to make a discussion for you of why a TTC has worked in this case, retrospectively, which you may have thought of it or may not even thought of it. So normally our midfoot shako, you would put a long plates and beam screws. That was, that would be a normal treatment for midfoot. Yeah. 
why did you go for a ttc did you think what anish has discussed that by stabilizing the tailors into the ankle joint you would be able to stop the rotation in the subtalar and the talo navicular thereby keeping yeah. the talo navicular joint in place i do not think so i am sorry but i am trying to be um straight i don't think so we had that idea that this was stabilize in the talo navicular joint is that correct yeah <laughs> yes actually <laughs> definitely it is a post op right now it is a post op 2 years uh, follow okay. up so definitely okay. it is work okay so it has worked for some time my point now to anish and karthik both you see that yeah. the nail has broken at the subtalar joint yeah. so now you will have a whole dissociation of the ankle fusion part so the proximal part subtalar is now mobile now do you think that again he will have a shako in the midfoot and the subtalar can he develop I think, that i think the i think the subtalar joint is fused actually i don't yeah. then it would not have broken the nail see the no no i think because the nail broke the fusion completed okay. itself compressed yeah, yeah 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 that is the reason yeah so, so i think this something i think the I, subtalar I, I joint is fused if if his thought was that the, the thought is very forward thinking to nail <laughs> but i i mean it so bohe and anderson have described this for flat foot and i've done it and it is amazing at how powerful that trick is sacrificing the ankle for hind foot stability is backwards how we were trained but is very brilliant okay. and it should not be used routinely but i think most of us if the ankle was normal looking even with arthropathy still would have done a triple Because that's where the deformity mm -hmm. was, and then if the ankle went into valgus, said crap, and then fused the ankle joint. Because if his ankle isn't that much dislocation for three years, there's a nice. I've experienced this, and I've talked about it as well. HSS published it as well about two years ago. There's a 23 percent rate of ankle valgus following triple in non-deformity ankle. So if this person has dislocated TN joint, the deltoid ligament has seen nothing for two years. You put the tail and navicular back in place, remove the subfibular impingement. There's a chance that the ankle will now collapse because there's erosion laterally. Yeah. So doing a TTC in that case, if the tail tail and navicular joint is flexible as was done here, is brilliant and clearly can work, no question. But you have to make sure the tail and navicular joint is extremely flexible. And I think your plan should be for triple first. But if you get in there and you can pop the tail and navicular joint in place. and they're older you never want to go back in this is a novel idea and and does work i mean this is it's amazing and if you got lucky hey sometimes in life lucky is better than good i mean it's genius anish and karthik yeah. looking at this x ray if the nail has broken why is the other screw not broken that's a 6.5 or a 4 no i think that that might have been put in later No, no, no. That screw was day one. It's a screw which is extra nail, extra medullary. Extra nail. Well, that is the, yeah. yeah extra because nail. this oh. is this is I know the company which makes it, and that screw doesn't go through that. So oh, that is a separate yeah. screw which is going from the calcaneum part of talus and part into the ankle. So if the nail is broken and if the, then the union has happened, this screw should have also been broken. <coughs> so it's a partially threaded screw. My yes. thought is, you see this nail. I don't know this company, but I think the whole you know this company, Anish. Have I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the whole screw. So, okay. Is it your nail? No, 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 my nail. Karthik got it. Karthik got it. I've got it. Karthik, uh, so Karthik, you know it's it's too big, man. You gotta make it tighter. So no, I it's think, not. I don't know. Not, I, I don't use it. I'm, it's no, it's okay. not Cartex. It's not Cartex. Okay. Well, I think the hole is too big. The metal is too thin, so it failed there. But because the other crew is partially threaded, as that snapped, It'll there's collapse. some pivot in the system. It can slide a little bit, and yeah. there's not a lot of torque on that partially threaded screw. If that screw was fully threaded, oh, I bet you it would have snapped as well. Correct. Yeah. I think that's what happened. The okay. only explanation I think of. So so okay. so point is both of, from just summarizing you yeah. and I think uh, Anish which you, article which you said is from Jonathan Dela and, and Scott Ellis where they say your flat foot reconstruction once you do a triple then you you start getting that 
ankle valgus you get and you invariably have to stabilize that in uh, pradeep can i just uh, interject there because yeah. if you looked at the peritoneal dislocation that you see for example in a tip coast deficiency mm -hmm. i know this is a, this is a different scenario but in the severe cases you get a very significant valgus deformity mm -hmm. we still i still don't do pantelas as a routine because i think the functional outcome from a pantela is terrible so what i do is a triple and i do medial ligament reconstruction i think i think that's a provided the ankle is not arthritic i think it's still worthwhile preserving the ankle joint because i think the biggest biomechanical assault on 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 the foot and the ankle as a whole is an ankle fusion it it causes the biggest debility it causes the most significant alteration uh, as far as gait is concerned you know and and with the pantelas i mean you i've never read a paper which said oh you got you've got great functional result from pantel it's a disaster in terms of function Correct. so Correct. as a routine this philosophy a paper, man. Yeah. this is a true straight up ttc yeah yeah oh yeah 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 not true. as bad as Van Taylor. but I if you look just to defend him in a 70 year old yeah 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 sure sure there what is this guy doing he walks around i mean honest to god he's not doing much and if you do the medial soft tissue, which I advocate as well, but I'll be honest, I struggle very hard, even yep. with internal brace and extra osteotomy. The goddamn thing goes in a valgus a bunch of times. Now, it's radiographic more than clinical, right? You'll see, yes. you notice yes. to all of us, right? Looks bad to you. Patient says, thank you, did a good job. Your fellow sees the x-ray and says, what did you do? You said, look, man, I know it looks bad. <laughs> Shut up. It's fine. So... Yep. A little valgus is okay, but if it really dislocated post-op, then the poor guy needs now what? Revision, yeah. triple, deltoid reconstruction, possible ankle replacement to avoid a pan tailor. So in an elderly patient, this is not a bad idea, but not to be done in a 40-year-old. No, the, the, yeah. the, the, yeah. the reason why I'm saying this is if you looked at a chronic telonavicular dislocation, I don't think as an average uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon you're going to reach for a TTC nail. I don't no. think that should be the take-home yes. message. You say, yes. if you've got yeah. a midfoot yeah. dislocation, the idea is to try and reduce the midfoot dislocation, stabilize the midfoot dislocation. And if, uh, you know, uh, foresight is, is fantastic, but I, I, I have to be honest and say, I would never have even remotely thought of choosing a TTC fusion for a chronic midfoot dislocation. That will not be my treatment algorithm. I can guarantee you that. And okay. that by rings as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, again, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's worked because, you know, the, the problem is, the, so the question was that this, the problem for this chap was not pain, he's neuropathic. The problem was that he had a chronic ulcer and he had a funny looking foot. So the suspicion is that no matter what you do to the bloody thing, you know, it wouldn't have affected his pain status because the pain was not his problem. He had a horrible looking gait. He had an ulcer or, you know, pressure sore that just simply didn't heal. So I mean, you could you could drill a hole in his uh, in his head and let the evil vapors out, and he would still have probably been all right, as long as you've stabilized. Uh, I mean, you've reduced the dislocation. Now, if you looked at this post-op X-ray, you can already see that that telonavicular joint is completely buggered. I mean, there's there's not much left of that telonavicular joint. So the question will be, he's not going to be in pain. You know, there's never going to be an issue of pain. So you probably will get away with it. But as a, a as a form of giving the message out about the algorithm for a midfoot dislocation, the answer is reduction and stabilization of the, of the, uh, of the dislocation. Not- hey, Carson, yeah. I got a question. Why do you guys keep saying midfoot? Is that a European thing, man? We call no, this- uh, you, 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 you this way, But you all keep saying this is midfoot. Oh, uh, no. The, so it's from, from the, from the uh, telonavicular joint to the, the uh, tarsal metatarsal joints is the midfoot component. That's the traditional- uh, okay. It's part of the midfoot. It's part okay. of the midfoot. Well, you have ankle and midfoot and toe? <laughs> yes, you have ankle, midfoot, and forefoot. <laughs> okay, We're quick question. To to okay, guys. Yeah. You don't understand what the hell you're talking about, man. <laughs> okay. Just one extra word. I'm just saying. <laughs> Okay, Anish. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> Anish and Karthik, quick question. If it was it, on another thought, if it was pure telonavicular dislocation, which was quite flexible, just doing a telonavicular fusion would would solve the problem? Yes, absolutely. And not even taking subtailor into the whole equation at no, all? No, you don't need to. No, no. no. Okay, thank no. you very much. Abhijit, fantastic case no. for discussion and a very, very, very forward-thinking case, I would say. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, now, uh, can you please stop sharing the screen and I'll give it uh, next to Dr. Yeah. Kapil yeah. Saoji, who has been my uh, foot and ankle fellow. Um, he will present um, on one of the four foot cases. So it has worked out quite well because we started with almost like ankle proximal side and we're moving distally. So uh, Kapil. Uh, Dr. Kapil. Hello. Hello. Yes, Kapil. Hello, sir. Yes. Yeah, good evening, sir. Good evening. Please share your screen. Uh, actually, the host is not a, a co-host has asked you to start the video. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kapil has to be made the co-host. Yeah. So now just go. Yeah, he's there. So share yeah. screen. So, Kapil sir, I have already made uh, Kapil sir as a co-host. So you have okay. to refresh. Yeah. Okay, is okay. it now? Yeah. Yeah. My screen is now available for all. Yes, we oh. have. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Kapil Sauji, fellow of Dr. Radeep Munod, sir, in foot and ankle. Uh, I'm going to present a case of neglected uh, foot trauma uh, leading to hallux valgus. Uh, we had a patient of 22 year old boy. I had three year back injury. Three months. Football, three months back injury while playing football, which was managed conservatively in body strapping by general orthopedician after six after six weeks he noticed lateral deviation of the great toe uh, in next three weeks uh, he observed the uh, increasing deviation and associated with the pain after three months of the injury he uh, presented to us with this deformity then uh, the X, this was the first X-ray done immediately after the injury, uh, which shows avulsion fracture of the base of proximal phalanx. Uh, after 10 weeks, the X-ray shows there is increased lateral deviation of the proximal phalanx. Uh, then we uh, the CT scan was also performed, the, which shows avulsion fracture measuring 7, 7 by 8 mm in size, which was separated from the proximal phalanx. The MRI was also done, uh, which suggests intact MCL with avulsion fragment attached. Uh, before operation, uh, uh, the avulsion fracture was identified under the Siam and it, it was marked uh, using a needle. Then the uh, incision was marked on the medial side of the foot, uh, centering the avulsion frag fragment extending 2 cm proximal and 3 cm distal. Then the skin incision was taken, soft tissue dissection was done and the uh, fracture fragment was uh, separated from the surrounding tissue. As the fracture fragment was very small, it was uh, excised out. Uh, then the anchor was inserted in the base of the proximal phalanx. Uh, 1.8 mm titanium anchor was used. Then the medial closest osteotomy of proximal phalanx was done, also known as Atkins osteotomy. And the osteotomy was fixed using a staple. Then MCL was repaired uh, with uh, MCL was reattached to the base of proximal phalanx using suture anchor. Uh, this was the final correction after surgery, suggestion of uh, complete correction of the deformity with uh, staple and anchor in situ. The patient was followed up after three months. Uh, the x-ray was done, suggestive of uh, union at the fracture site. At three month follow up, patient had no pain. He was walking normal on, uh, he was walking in normal footwear, complete active and passive range of motion was there. And he returned to the uh, sport activity are having the football. And then at one year follow up, there were no any gross def uh, visible deformity. Uh, the patient is doing quite well till now, sir. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, open for discussion. Karthik and uh, Anish. Okay. Uh, can I ask you to go back to the MRI scan? Yes. Yes. Um, it's, I'm, I'm curious about the injury. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, there yes, we sir. go. So the sagittal MRI, I'm just looking to see if there's any chance that this might actually be a formal turf toe. Because these are not sections for the... Uh, 
So the the uh, at least one of the plantar plates looks quite intact, and it's an unusual injury. Yes. Because yes, usually sir. you have these yes. big avulsions as a result of direct valgus, uh, and it's very rare in, in a weight bearing foot to get direct valgus. It's usually valgus and rotation, and you often you often will get a a, a plantar component to it. Uh, yeah, you have a medial plantar plate tear, uh, because what I couldn't make out from your original uh, uh, clinical photograph was whether there was dorsiflexion deformity uh, in addition to valgus. Uh, I was just curious about that. Was was there a dorsiflexion clinically? No. Okay. This was a pure, sorry, uh, I'll just answer that. I think uh, Kapil, he didn't see that preoperatively. There right. was a pure translation, pure lateral deviation. There was not going okay. up or down. And uh, CT scan, I would have ordered a CT, but he, he is a son of the Director General of Police of Maharashtra. And he came to us and he had shopped down on everybody with everybody, somebody ordering a CT scan, somebody ordering a MRI. So that's why we had all the information. But right. there was no vol vola plate was intact. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it's perfectly well done. Just curious about the, uh, the aching because I think that's actually a very good idea. Doing yeah. a small aching will actually relax the tissue there, allow it to heal without tensioning. From, you know, that's a, that's a clever idea. And I'm, that's I, what I thought. So when I was doing that, I thought that I uh, just want to detension the whole medial yeah. uh, soft tissues and just get your EHL to work for you as well. Yeah, that's, 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 uh, that's a very good idea. And I think that's something that I've learned. I mean, I've, I've had the turf toe corrections, but I've never... I have done in a in a in a late turf toe. I have done just to correct the deformity, not to relax the me medial structures. But that's certainly something that I will I will take with me. That's a good idea. Well done. Good, Anish. That's a great idea. No, these are commonly missed and ignored. And I I I agree with Karthik. Mostly, I see uh, the lateral deviation with dorsal instability. Yeah. And if you ask and examine, and in this case, you have all the evidence of an avulsion, so unique case. Um, and the Aiken, I think, is genius. I've never done the Aiken for this. I'm yeah. writing the article after I'm done with this. I have a clinics article to write about this stupid problem. And most people ignore it. So I've done the internal brace augmentation for chronic without the avulsion. Because for me, just doing the suture anchor never worked. Now, suture anchor and Aiken, that's different animal. Yeah. So I've been using the internal brace to pull as hard as I can. And I would do a lateral release. Okay, so you did a lateral release by doing the Aiken. I, and yes. I like it. It mm. looks very nice. Because I think the, the Aiken, it was just sitting there anyway. And it was literally like a five minute job. And these staples, I've devised it myself in India. So, ah, yes. Wonderful. Because that short arm distally is great. Mm. The other thing is, if you get in a situation where it's a turf toe variant, traumatic hallux valgus without, with some dorsal subluxation, mm. you do have to go more plantar. And I make a triangle. This is avulsion. So if there's no avulsion, a triangle to get medial plantar and you have to put multiple suture to close that gap. Yeah. And then I will back it up with an internal brace. And I've got Olympic athletes back with that technique only. Cosmetically, you're still better. It, <laughs> it does look better this way. Um, I think the biggest lesson to learn besides your Aiken is not to miss this diagnosis. Yeah. Mm. That is the biggest thing that you can learn as we as surgeons. If somebody comes in and they have a abduction, dorsiflexion injury, they have pain, get the MRI, examine them, not just straight dorsal, it's a dorsal lateral subluxation and reconstruction like you did is brilliant. Brilliant. Good. After this, I had two patients, similar type of injury, but luckily they united at three months. So I'm now really keep a close eye on these kind of avulsion fractures. Yeah, I do you strap them hard? I think you have to very carefully strap them, protect them, not just say go in a gym shoe, you'll be fine. Sure, sure. Kapil, you have to say anything? Anything else, Karthik? No, no, I'm absolutely fine. I mean, I think the MR is really, really important because there are several things that you can pick out in the MR. One is a dorsal impaction injury. With many of these sort of hyperdorsiflexion rotational anomalies, you forget that, you know, the the proximal phalanx smashes into the dorsal part of the, uh, uh, of the, of the toe. And, and if you are an Olympic sportsman, if you're an elite athlete, if you're a rugby player, you need to let them know, mate, look, you've, you've got some significant chondral damage and the likelihood is that you may get some arthritis here. And I think that's an important thing in managing patient expectation. 
good excellent sir i want to just ask if this question would have come to us uh, the patient would have come to us in the beginning just after after the injury then what would be our plan Wait, should we do only anchor fixation or that time also you will do the akins uh, uh, or no you you wouldn't do any of those you would do what uh, pradeep has done with the subsequent two cases keep a close eye on it keep it well strapped and and it it, it, it in all in most of the cases it will heal up you don't need to operate in them at all okay sir and sir any uh, specific method for doing strapping miss should we put some spacer between first and second toe to just make the varus in the first great toe anish yeah i strap it like a bunion strap so exactly. depending you have commercial bunion straps that are available or you tape it and tape them so that they are in slight dogness and i tell them to use a silicone spacer in between because what you're relying on is it's not going to heal in varus that is never going to happen yeah never you're trying to just take that tension off and you're not going to cast them obviously but i use it for 3 months and then after 6 weeks they can start doing dorsiflexion plantar flexion range of motion but that abduction because that's a tiny piece of bone you want that bone to heal and scar properly 3 months before you let them go back and i use a toe spacer for another 3 months on their gym shoes because the problem is it's annoying for the first 5 6 months but if you get half healing and then it starts to deviate again you're back to this yeah so torture them explain to them that is this or either to wear the stupid spacer and strap it for 3 months and then spacer for 3 more months or you can get a reconstruction and see what happens so kapil the key thing is to understand that these patients are not to be managed by buddy strapping okay yes. as what you would do for all your toe fractures and stuff these has to be managed keeping the the great toe straight and by yes, by uh, your bunion splints and you have bunion the straight splint. bunion splints that's what yes, that's what anish and uh, kartik were saying great yes, thank you sir wonderful job man thank you okay i think that comes to an end of a great session we almost had two and a half hours sitting here on webinars on neglected foot and ankle thank Pradeep you very sir. much guys Pradeep yes sir. yes abhi ji rodi yeah abhi yeah yeah i have a request to both uh, kartik sir and anish sir for next year uh first one is in calcutta for us next time and if us con this time if us con is already cancelled i have sent a mail everyone yes thank you thank you abhi ji yeah thank yeah. you yeah. anish yeah. anish uh, kartik and all the case presenters thank you very much for spending this time i know it's been a big task and there would have been some grilling there would have been some critique but i'm sure it is for the best of all of us to learn from the giants like both kartik and anish they have given their full time and effort as well as the whole experience what they have learned i would really thank again uh, alambic as well for organizing this thank you very much guys thank, thank you all and just remember you. you know anything that we speak here we speak because we all learn it's not just me imparting knowledge to you i've learned so much from this and that's why i enjoy these uh, webinars because it's it's a mutual process i mean some of the cases that you guys have shown i mean i would cringe at my age i don't want this kind of shit but you guys have done remarkably well and i'm i'm grateful that you that you brought these cases in to show us thank you thank you for inviting me thank you thank you so thank much for this thank you thank you everyone may i before we end sir i would just like to thank all the delegates faculty members speakers and these and giving us an opportunity all my co presenters thank you so much thank you very much pradeep sir for giving me such an opportunity it was really honorable thing and i hope we continue doing this and i am really grateful for you really thank grateful you. Thank we you have sir. a we have a webinar next week which is on a next saturday we are going to start on great uh, grand rounds okay and the first of the topic is on tendon transfer symposium and we have eric blumen we have david richardson and andrea all three of them they will be talking on tendon transfers in foot and ankle so please join in Cheers guys okay. god bless you all and keep safe thank you thank you so oh, much thank you everybody thank, thank you, you anish and thank you kartik olympic pradeep sir i would uh, just like to thank all the delegate members 
for taking in their uh, precious time and you know uh, giving us an opportunity to conduct this cme or also like to thank all the participants who took their precious time out from this saturday evening and attended the very informative session and it was an excellent uh, session sir uh, i hope uh, it was an uh, good good seminar and uh, everyone had key uh, home take out to this uh, seminar once again sir really thank you to all the delegates and uh, we just hope and pray that you all stay safe and strong in this uh, pandemic era thank you so much sir i hope you have a great evening guys right? thank you goodbye thank, thank, thank you thank you very bye. much bye. to entire faculty sir thank you dr pradeep thank you thank you bye